Okay, good morning, um, everyone. You're very welcome to the Infrastructure Committee. Um, we have um, a quorum in, in a number of ways, actually. We've got uh, people coming in from via Starleaf, and then there's two of us in, in the chamber. So you're all very welcome to today's meeting. And today we will consider um, subordinate legislation, and we'll also then be receiving um, briefings from all the Northern Ireland ports and from Retail NI. Just to advise those who are joining via Starleaf, if you do wish to um, to comment or raise a, or make a, ask a question, just to um, press the hands up icon just to register that, and we'll endeavour to take you in the order in which you do that. Um, and also for those who are coming in via Starleaf, if you could mute your mics so it just doesn't interfere then with um, the evidence hearings as we as we go through. Um, this morning's agenda. Uh, I've received an apology from Mr Hildage. And then moving on to item two, we have chair's business. I just draw your attention, There's, it has been drawn to our attention that there was a typographical error in the minutes of the 16th of December. And in accordance with standing orders, and given that this was agreed by the committee, it must be drawn to members' attention in this meeting, and then included as an agenda item in next week's meeting for committee approval. So if you're content, then we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that next week. Moving then to draft minutes at page six, and they're the draft minutes of the meeting of the 10th of February. Is everyone content? Any issues at this stage? Nope. Moving then to our matters arising at page 13. Again, that's for the meeting of the 10th of February. Do members have any issues arising from the meeting? Okay, we also have at page 17, outstanding committee requests for information and um, you'll see that- Sarah, the matter arising. Um, Ms. Anderson? Sorry, I'm under Sorry, I can't hear you very well. I had a matter under, under matters arising. Um, it was in relation to the paper we received on the road spawns paper. And looking at the recommendations, they said there would be a cooperation form established between stakeholders. I know in my own constituency in Derry, we have a lot of problems with unadopted roads and sewage. So I would like to ask if we could have a briefing from the department, perhaps to find out since the inquiry, what has been taken or just for all of us to express um, our views with regards to this issue and see if we could put a bit of focus and attention on it. Okay, well, if, you're, if you're content, what we could do is just to refresh the memory of the department just with, with regards to this inquiry and ask them um, you know, how they've addressed each of the recommendations and, um, and schedule a, a briefing from them in, um, in the future. But if we can... If we could maybe get in the, in the short term, if we could get them to um, comment on the recommendations as um, as laid out there, um, and it means that we can then consider what what other action that we want to take, if that's okay. Yeah. Now this is an issue that's um, not just exclusively in your constituency. I think it's just right across um, the pace. So content to do that. Yeah. Any other any other issues coming out of matters arising? Chair, sorry. Ms. Hello, Chair. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Uh, thank, thanks, Chair. I was actually on the Regional Development Committee when that inquiry was conducted. And um, I, um, if you recall, whenever the um, team came to tell us about the planning review, we raised it also. And I just wonder, in terms of um, trying to tie those two t things together around some of the conditions or time frames. It, it has been something we have had a lot of difficulty with um, um, in my own constituency as well. And it wasn't helped, of course, by the, the crash and then NAMA, you know, and who owned what, you know, and how developments had changed hands. And sometimes, I'm sure, Martina, you've seen the same thing where the same developer goes out of business and then opens up another company. You know, and there are they're serial offenders as well. And that was, I think, what Common Dad made to the planning team, that there should be some cognizance given to those people who routinely 
uh, don't live up to their expectations. But I just wonder, in trying to tie the two t- thing to get two together, what uh, opportunities there are within the planning review to look at the conditionality of permissions in relation to, um, you know, the enforcement actions. That was just. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, no, I think that's that's appropriate today. Okay, we can tie that together. Yeah. Okay. Can. Any other comments? Everyone content? Okay. Thank you. Okay, destroy page 29, um, that's that inquiry, and obviously content to write to the department in relation to that. Moving then to correspondence, item 5, um, destroy your attention to the correspondence memo at page 36, and also at, tabled at page 3. So members of any comments? We've obviously a, 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 a correspondence from the Friends of uh, Knock Ivey. Um, in relation to planning issues, and it'd be useful then to forward that to that correspondence to the department. It's not clear whether that has gone to the department or not, although I'll probably assume that it has. And then at page 57, we've always the correspondence with regards to the taxi driver's financial assistance scheme, which we'll, we'll return to at um, item 7 um, of our agenda. Page 61, there are issues. Um, which we raised with the department and it's a response to them that was from the 27th of January and obviously we had a number of queries around the bus and coach operator scheme which um, they've attempted to address we will be we will be discussing this next week when the department comes with their proposals um, and at this stage, I suppose we're really unclear as to what those are going to be. We also have uh, correspondence from Coney tabled at page four, and that gives a reflection of the meeting which they had with the department on that. Um, and then tabled at page six, which ties in with our last comment from Dolores there, just in relation to the call for evidence for the review of the implementation of the Planning Act. I think Andrew maybe had something you wished to raise with regards to that as well. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think it's been tabled. I think we just need to get clarity about what engagement there's going to be with the committee or maybe conversely what we're, how we're going to engage with the officials around that because I know that there's a, a relatively tight time scale around that. So maybe that's something to be considered at the next committee meeting in terms of what our planned engagement is around that review. Okay. Ms. Anderson. Um, thank, thank you, Chair. I would like to um, deal with the matter on page 63. Um, I know you said we probably will be returning to this, but Chair, my little concern in relation to the bus scheme is that um, Sinn Féin has met with the bus operators. I'm sure other parties have done the same, and they are very frustrated, as we would all know, uh, with the previous scheme. Now, it states that 140 applications uh, out of 140, only 80, 84 had been assigned as eligible. So the reps had told us that uh, many have not received the full payment, and while 54 have been deemed um, ineligible. So with the second scheme coming on board, and I'm conscious because we'll be dealing later on with the taxi scheme, with the second scheme coming on board, could we ask the infrastructure minister to engage with the sector to iron out the problems encountered by them in the first scheme so that they can be addressed in the second scheme? Because I keep feeling like as MLAs in this committee, we raise issues and we highlight them and flag them up and red flag them and hope that they have been dealt with. And then we're presented with a scheme and we're told, well, look, if we delay this, this is going to stop people getting their payment. But the difficulties haven't been addressed. So I see in relation to the bus scheme that it was about downturn. That's what you know, bus operators thought that they had to demonstrate that there was a downturn, but then when they got to further into the application the process, they were told it was profits. And I would just like to make a comparator. Like when cafes were told that they could do takeaways, people weren't then looked at, well, did you make a profit or how is your profit margin? And that will determine whether you get the grant. They were adversely affected by the restrictions and therefore they received the grant. But that doesn't seem to have happened for, for bus operators. And so I'm concerned that maybe a second scheme may not take that into account. And we also have the issue, Chair, that we need to be keeping on the agenda because chauffeurs, those who deal uh, in that particular area, are telling us that they are not eligible for the Part B, even though they have been told to go to Part B um, in the Department of Economy scheme. 
So there's lots of things falling away from this. And as we raise them and try, as I think we're doing it in a way to try and assist the department to iron these out before another scheme comes uh, on board, then we're faced with another scheme and the same problems are there. Okay, and of course, at this stage, we're, we're, we are in the dark because obviously a scheme is, has been drafted because of their coming next week to present it to us. Um, at this stage, we know very little as to whether or not and the minister dodged the question as to whether it would be an extension of the, of the scheme that we had or it would be a new scheme which would take on board the lessons which had been learned and certainly uh, as you've reflected having discussed had a discussion with some of the bus operators i don't feel that they they're that content that a lot's going to change yeah well that's i, I think that's our fear that we're now going to be presented with a scheme that may come in front of this committee or regulation and we're going to be told but well, look if we try to tamper with this delay then these drivers or these operators aren't going to get the much needed financial assistance and that sort of leaves us then in a difficult situation with all of these schemes but in the development of these schemes when we're flagging up the problems and the problems are there and all the parties are hearing about them and i think there's cross-party support for addressing them in this committee and yet we're presented by the department with a scheme that for me isn't reflected even in the fanfare of announcements or the genuine announcements by the minister about these schemes uh, and yet what comes out the other end from the department seems to be a number of obstacles and preventing some of these operators or drivers or whatever the situation would be, preventing them from getting access to the much needed schemes and the hardship, the, the grants that they need. So, Chair, I'm just a wee bit confused or concerned even that this department is not actually taking account of the committee's views at all. Okay, well, if you're content, that we, if members are content that we reflect that um, just in advance then of... The scheme obviously um, coming to committee and I would anticipate that we'll probably get a clearer view on that probably by the end of the week because normally we would have papers um, yeah. for issuing by Friday so at that stage um, we'll, we'll know. Chair, I, do, I, do, I do have to, Chair. Ms Kelly? Yeah, thank you Chair. Chair, I do have to say that I think some of the criticism is unfair. I mean, the Minister's made it very clear there's value for money elements that forbids her from being able to do some things. And we're not being entirely honest when we don't acknowledge the fact that many of the businesses and operators have access to other funds. You know, and we're not going to be able to, I don't think, uh, address all of the needs or wants during this pandemic. And I think that's widespread across all businesses. Um, you know, so I, I would just like a wee bit of honesty in, in the um, analysis in terms of what's being done and what's not being done. Uh, uh, whilst I agree that the committee should be given its place and information given uh, before the committee as, as, as quickly and as uh, soon as possible uh, for, for members to uh, consider, I don't think all of the criticism is uh, fair nor warranted. I just want to put that on record. Well, I'm, I'm, I don't think that, that that's probably what we're trying to do either. I think what we are wanting is some clarity around all of this as well and to ensure that those concerns which have been raised and, and have been... Um, and that have been felt as, we, as we've seen um, from the, the, the representation which we've had that they're being acknowledged within the department. Sure. Well, Chair, it's just sometimes people have been given the answer and they don't like the answer. <coughs> okay, Mr. Buchanan. Yeah, just, just a point to, to pick up on Ms. Anderson's point. If you look at page 64, there's a lessons learned from first bus and coach scheme. So obviously officials on the minister met on the first and the ninth, so we will see based on that what lessons they have learned and why they reflect on the on, on both sectors and, and bring it into the second scheme, the problems they had and the difficulties. So we will see if, if they have listened. And not, not taken away from Ms Anderson's point, whether they listen to us or the, the, the actual people at the cold face and, and make changes to the scheme. Okay. Ms Kimmins? Chair. Uh, oh, sorry. Can I... oh. Chair, just on this point, I mean, Chair, I, I appreciate what Dolores is saying, everybody's saying, but Unfortunately, out there, you know, because of the licensing and all the regulations that go through DFA, there's an expectation that DFA will deal with. We also appreciate that there's other schemes out there that people can apply for. But all we're asking for is clarity. I'm sure the committee and all its membership will support the people in applying for funding and get whatever funds it is to get it out on the ground. And that's the key element here. And certainly we we'll learned from previous schemes but we as a committee have a responsibility. If DFA is collecting all the information in relation to bus operators, in relation to taxi operators, in relation to taxis, well, then there's an obligation there to look. And we as a committee will support that. I know it's a difficult period, but 
There's money's there. The minister keep them. Finance minister said there's money there. So I'd like to see us collectively as a committee support all of those schemes and support the people to get the money, get it out on the ground as quickly as possible. I learn from what has been in the past. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Kimmins and then Mr. Muir. Thanks, Mr. Chair. 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 on a separate issue now. It's about another item in the, the table papers under correspondence about the taxi operators. Can we, Am I okay? Am I or do you want to wait? Can we wait until we finish the coach operators? Sorry, yeah. Um, I wasn't too sure. Yes, no problem. Okay. Mr. Muir, was it coach operators? No, no. So, um, Mr. Beggs, coach operators? Yeah, yes, it is. Okay. Uh, coach operators. Um, I, I think, uh, given the high numbers of um, applications that were turned down, that we, we should be asking for a review of the criteria. Um, we'd have to be realistic that if people have been making profit, this, this isn't to enable people to make more profit. It's uh, the conditions around COVID funding is, that, uh, is to enable people to recoup losses. Um, but there is a... a a likelihood that very severe restrictions have been put in place as to who may be applicable and we should be reinforcing our request that this should be reviewed before uh, we're presented with the final proposal because in reality next week uh, is very very tight um, there will only be about another month when the money will have to be allocated and accounted for um, and it will be very difficult to change anything uh, after next week uh, because of the, the limited time period. So I think we should be looking, uh, or requesting that there should be a further review of the criteria to determine whether it is overly harsh and whether additional uh, uh, criteria could be used which would enable more to benefit from it. Okay, um, Ms. Anderson? Um, Chair, I just want to put it on the record um, that I wouldn't want anyone at all to think that I was being in any way dishonest, reflecting the views of the representatives that we met and the fact that what Roy has said has been their experience, that they have had hurdle after hurdle in terms of a bureaucratization of a process that has meant and prevented them from getting access to a scheme. We need to try and support these businesses so when we come out of this pandemic that they are surviving. There's been a number of businesses have already collapsed. So we need to try and iron out the wrinkles going forward and try and ensure that the second scheme enables those drivers to get access to the scheme and hopefully over the longer period of time because the volume of, of them that have been rejected is concerning. It's concerning for my party in Sinn Féin and I have been genuinely reflecting the deep views and feelings and concerns of those operators for themselves, their businesses, their families and their workers. Okay. Thank you. Mr Boylan, is that the same issue? Different issue, Chair. Okay, well, I'm going to go back to Liz. Okay, thanks, Chair. No, it's just in, in relation to the letter from Phoenix Law that we received. I know that emailed people as well separately. Um, obviously, we've been raising this for, for a number of months now around the taxi operators. We've had them in committee. We've um, had correspondence from them in the last couple of weeks as well. Um, but still, there's there's been no financial support provided by the department. I mean, at this stage, I think... You know, we've we've all. I think we're all on the same page in this. I mean, does it, do we need to to bring a motion, a committee motion on it? Um, because as as you know, we talked about the bus and coach operators. The impact of this on taxi operators is is very severe, and and we heard that firsthand. But of it, but nothing has changed. Um, you know, just the department don't seem to be coming back with anything at all on this. It's um, so it's just to kind of put that suggestion out there. Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Just two issues in relation to the correspondence on page 61 from the department. First one was in relation to roadworks projects and the unspent budget in 2020-21. Um, when we were having discussions with the officials, they were outlining the issues with regards to human resources and the lack thereof, and then the ability to be able to take forward uh, projects. It would be useful to get a, a, an understanding historically where, what that situation has been um, and what the plans are to address that because it's affecting the ability for the department to take things forward. So I don't know if it would be possible to send off correspondence to the department 
requesting that information so we have an understanding of what the resourcing is within the relevant division to be able to take forward these works because it's inhibiting the delivery of those works. Now, another issue as well, so I just wanted to deal that one first. Okay, the members agreed on that, yes. Okay. Yeah. And, the and the other one, just on page 62, um, is in relation to the electro, uh, electric vehicle charging points and the response there. Um, one of the particular issues is around the ESB charging points and the standard of those. Um, and I was going to suggest that we invite ESB in um, to, to hear evidence and to hear a bit more about what their plans are for the network. But I understand from speaking to the uh, clerk, we may want to consider uh, a separate session in relation to this and plan that next week. Um, or not the session, but you know, a planning session around the whole issue of these electrical vehicle charging points and particularly hearing from officials. So just want to see what the way is to proceed in relation to that. Yes, we're meeting and we're having a close session next week just in relation to the whole issue around decarbonisation and how we want to take that forward. So at that stage, maybe we want to consider then who we want to call and obviously what our focus will be. And yeah, that'd be great. That'd be appreciated. We'll have that conversation next week if you're content to do that. Um, yeah. Okay, um, Mr. Boylan. Sure. Yeah. Just in relation to to PS forty eight and the friends of Knock of A. I mean, clearly there's lack of clarity in the, the how and why the department has gone down the route it has. And obviously, there's a number of questions there that the the group haven't received or a couple of queries they put in. Then and also that the minister hasn't met the group. So, I mean, you know, they're saying about an exceptional set of circumstances. So we need clarity in that. We'd like to ask on behalf of the committee to, for, for the department to clarify that. And also as to why, you know, ABC should bear all the cost in relation to it. Those questions haven't been answered for the group. So, I mean, I'd like to support within the, in the committee here to write to the minister to clarify exactly what that is. Was this, Liz and myself and other members of, of many other parties have been contacted in relation to the Friends of Knockaway. So it seems it hasn't gone away. There's still there's still clarity around a number of issues. So now I'd like I'd like that clarity and for the group on behalf of the group. Sure. Okay. Mr. Beggs and then Mrs. Kelly. Mr. Beggs, you're on mute. Apologies, I hadn't lowered my hand from earlier. Kelly. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Chair, uh, I mean, Knock I Vale also straddles across as Cattle would know into my own uh, constituency. And uh, I think we're all aghast at the huge cost and the fact that there's a windmill there that people are, uh, I think there may well be subsidies being given for, and that's never really uh, in, in recent years had to uh, capture any uh, electricity charge. So it, it is a very uh, troubling. A situation. Um, however, uh, unfortunately, it was um, previous, if you like, administrations where this all started, and, and that's part of the problem. I think it was the Department of the Environment at the time had uh, responsibility. But uh, I've no difficulty in seeking uh, some of the answers, um, you know, uh, that people might want in, in relation to the campaign. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's a, a, a it has been a mistake made that there's huge costs involved. Uh, 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 to put right. But can I just go back to um, the earlier comments around the letter from the taxi operators and the proposals um, that uh, about emotion and all the rest of it? You know, th this is something I don't th that, that uh, I understood that they were getting some funding from D, the Department of the Economy. And I wonder, could we establish the facts? I think it'd be useful for the for our committee to write, as we did before, to other committees to ascertain what options uh, and uh, funding was available and already being in, in place and being given to many uh, before we go down the route uh, of uh, any sort of um, committee motion. Uh, at the end of the day, I understand that taxi operators fall under the gambit of the Department of the Economy. So I think we established the facts first before we make a decision like that. And um, it was just more of an aside on, on Mr Muir's comments about the electric charges. I seen somebody had a, a thing in the paper, uh, maybe it was over in England, mind you, where she got £5,000 free electricity because some place it didn't charge. So I'd imagine that uh, if we do go into a public session at some stage and where the charging points are and who gives electricity free, and who charges, <laughs> there'd be a, a, a great stampede, <laughs> if you like, by some of those electric car owners. Anyway, it's just a, an observation. Thank you. 
Thank you. So just to go back to the point with regards to the taxi operators, we haven't agreed yet. That was obviously a suggestion which Liz had made just in her comments. Obviously, this um, correspondence, which we've been copied into, and we have a cover note to, um, is a solicitor's letter to the minister. Um, it was issued on the 12th of February, and the, she's been given, obviously, seven days to respond. So we don't really know what the response will be between um, the department and taxi operators with regards to that. Although I suppose what we can do is just to um, write again to the department just to reiterate our support for um, a bespoke taxi operators um, support scheme um, as we have done um, consistently throughout this process if members are content. Could we also chair write to the department, the committee for the economy just to clarify some of the, the points in terms of what support is available? It gets a bit confusing at times, part A and part B and who gets what, so I think that would be helpful. Intend to do that um, as well. So, member, members, any issues with regards to that? No. Nope. Okay. Sure. Mr. Boylan, you didn't. Yeah, sure. And, and, and I appreciate that, but but we need to stop this thing with bouncing from one department to the other. If the license fees is paid into DFA and the responsibility, then there's a responsibility within DFA as well. Now, there's no member in this committee will not support any of the operators not getting supports out there that they need. So, so let's explore all avenues for them. There's taxi operators contacting all of us day and daily, and they're trying to get on these schemes. They need support now. There's money available. So please, let, let's not get into this debate about which department is. If DFA is collecting the fees, they have a responsibility in some reflection. So I would like support in relation to that. We need to move this on and support the businesses as best we can. Chair, I've no difficulty in supporting. Sorry, Cal, I've, I've no difficulty chair in supporting, but I do think we have to be cognizant of who has the varies in these matters. You know, um, of course, we'll be doing this right on the time. We'll be doing this right on the times. Well, the yes, is, it is the, the, informa the information lies within DFA. The information might lie within DFA, but the varies the 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 might lie with a different department. And all we it want to well, do it is, is to establish the facts of the matter, chair. I don't think there's any difficulty in that. Sure. Sure, it has shown it has shown that DFA is taking responsibility for individual taxi operators. So there's an opportunity there. All I'm saying is we we as a committee have a responsibility to support those businesses out there that we are responsible for. And I do believe that DFA has a responsibility for the taxis and the taxi operators as well. Well, let's clarify these points, Chair, is all I'm saying. I would really appreciate, members, that if you are going to speak, that you do raise your hand rather than speaking over each other, because it is actually quite difficult to manage. So just, just on the point, I think we all recognise that there are various schemes which have been there um, in order to support, but what we're looking for specifically is a bespoke scheme. Um, as, has been, as has been created for other industries that should be there to support the taxi operators. Okay, Mrs Anderson. Chair, I just wish uh, we wouldn't refer to this as, you know, who has the powers and who hasn't. Every minister has got access to the financial assistance scheme. Every single minister. Conor Murphy, the Minister of Finance, has 27 payment processes going out from his department. And not once have we heard from the minister complaining that he doesn't and didn't have the fires when he brought in the local restriction schemes. He did it because it was his responsibility, he felt, when it was coming in, and he adapted that responsibility. In terms of in, in the industry um, that we are dealing with, and industries that we are dealing with, it is this department. So let's get away from who has the fairies, who shouldn't have the fairies. That is why the Financial Assistance Act is there for the minister to access as she has and that is appropriate and right, as has Conor Murphy as Minister of Finance and any other minister that needs access to it. That gives him the virus, gives the minister the opportunity to bring forward the scheme. This is about political will, not where and who has the virus, and is it one party's minister's responsibility or another. There are people out there struggling. They've been struggling for a year. They need support, and this minister needs to step up to the plate now and do more to be able to assist these people because she can get the authority to take this forward. And she has the support of all this committee, I believe, to take it forward in that way. Mrs. Kelly. Sorry, Chair, I don't know why some members don't have an understanding, particularly in view of the 
scathing uh, RHI uh, inquiry report into uh, public money and how and when and why decisions are made. All I'm asking is for some clarification and stating the obvious in terms of legal power. You know, uh, uh, I, I just hate that we're having to do all this nonsense. All I want to do is to establish the facts and stop. You know, we want to get the money out to the people that need it when they need it, but it has to be done uh, properly and value for money. And we are custodians of the public purse, you know, and we've seen where poor decisions have been made in the case of Knock IV and how future generations may well have to pick up the, the tab for when decisions aren't right. So I, I just don't think it's fair. And I, I restate uh, that I would want the uh, the committee to write to the Committee for the Economy and to just clarify what help is being given and where. And if there are gaps made, then let's look at those gaps and see who's best placed to do those. Sure, just one final point on that before we finish, please. Sorry. But it's just, I mean, I don't think anybody is suggesting we do anything that is outside of the law. Um, I mean, we're living in really unprecedented times, and I hate that word now because it's it's like a buzzword. But at the same time, we're dealing with a pandemic here, and people are in a situation that we could never have foreseen. The problem I have with it is, as others have said, we're a year on. The, the department have engaged with the taxi sector, as they've engaged with the bus and coach operators. So why provide support for one and not the other? You know, that's that's the bottom line for, for me. I mean, this to and fro, and I'm not getting into a, a whole debate about it again here, but it's just I just think it's important to state there's to and fro and back and forth here. You know, as others have said, speak to the executive, ask can we get, get the power to do it, and this committee will support it. And I think that's the end of it. I think we've exhausted that item. So if members are content, we can move on. Um, move on then to, um, if you're content with the actions that suggest the correspondence out with what we've decided um, in our conversation, um, if you're content then to agree the, the correspondence memo for all those other items which we didn't discuss. Okay. Moving then to item six, we have um, SL1, Ballyboley <coughs> Road, Larne, Abandonment Order in Northern Ireland 2021, and that's at page 67. The proposals are subject to negative resolution procedure. The rule will abandon an area of 2,650 square metres of Ballyboley Road, extending from a point 135 metres north of its junction with Rowan Avenue for a distance of 365 metres in a northwesterly direction. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Great. Okay, item 7, SR 2021-33, the Taxi Driver Coronavirus Financial Assistance Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021. And this is at page 71. The committee considered the proposal for the rule on the 13th of January and was content. The rule is subject to negative resolution. As outlined in correspondence, the proposals now include a pro rata payment mechanism. Are members content with this rule? Members, any comments? Great. Um, Chair. Ms. Anderson. Now, uh, Chair, uh, yeah, of course, uh, we again, we're faced with a regulation that we don't want to stop uh, taxi drivers from getting their much needed financial support. But as we raised it when it came before the committee, as we raised it before it was developed, um, I don't support the pro rata rule. We don't support it, but we have to let it go forward because we think that those taxi drivers who were shielding, who did not have the money and temporarily suspended their insurance should not be getting penalised in this way. That's not to stop it, but I would like that put on record. Okay. Everyone else content? Okay, thank you. So the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2021-33, the Taxi Driver Coronavirus Finan Financial Assistance Regulations Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the examiner's statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Okay, agreed. Moving then to item eight, which is subordinate legislation SR is not subject to assembly proceedings. There are three statutory rules um, for us to consider. At page 86, SR 2021-34, the school's part-time 20 mile per hour speed limit amendment order, Northern Ireland 2021. At page 99, SR 2021-35, the waiting restrictions Brian's Ford order, Northern Ireland 2021. And at page 103, SR 2021 36, the Parking and Waiting Restrictions Belfast Amendment Order, Northern Ireland, 2021. The committee considered the proposals on the 13th of January 
and we were content. Uh, I'd just advise you then just to note that these, the statutory rules, unless um, just all we're going to do at this stage really is note them unless you have any issues um, to raise. Members, any issues? Content? Okay, thank you. Moving then now to our briefing from the Northern Ireland ports. Ansard will record the session. And I'm going to um, welcome by Starleaf. We have um, Ricardo Panelli, the General Manager and Director of the Port of Larne, with David Holmes, the Chief Executive of Warren Point, Brian McGrath, the Chief Executive of London Dairy Port and Harbour, and Morris Bullock, who's the Finance and Compliance Director, um, Belfast Harbour Commissioners. We're hoping that he can join us although he is having technical issues, so um, he may be able to join us at some stage if that's possible. So, is everyone on? Okay, oh, everyone's here, thank you. Okay, so if you're, obviously we didn't receive a, a briefing paper, um, but we have agreed that um, each of you will speak for about five minutes just to give us a, an outline of um, sort of current issues, and then members will follow up with some questions. So, really, just taking the order I suppose that I called you. So, we've got Ricardo first, and then David, Brian, and Morris. Hello there. Good morning, Chair. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Thank you. Wonderful. So, thank you. This is I'm Ricardo Tonelli. I'm the general manager for the Larne Arbor Limited, and in this brief contribution, I'd like to share a little update on what we've been doing. Uh, in relation to our operations, Brexit, um, and then quickly move on to uh, free ports and uh, sort of a vision for the future for us. Um, in terms of operation, we have worked incredibly hard over the past few months to keep the port open and smoothly, you know, smoothly carrying freight mainly across the Irish Sea, uh, mainly with Cairn Ryan in Scotland and being a vital link between GB and Northern Ireland. Uh, we're proud to say that we, you know, we didn't have a single day where we had a queue at either ports, and that's through, through good cooperation with, uh, you know, between our teams, our customers, and Deer and Border Force, so that went extremely well, and we're very safety conscious. So we focused on how to interact safely, how to avoid or minimize COVID-related risks, and we want to continue to do that. And uh, we are keen to be at the forefront of the discussion when it comes to, um, you know, um, the protocol and new rules and what happens after the 1st of July. Uh, so we'd like to you know, just be in the room for that. Um, in terms of uh, Brexit, as was mentioned, we, we worked pretty, pretty well and pretty hard to keep our freight lines open, which which has happened, we we've had a good interaction with our customer base. We we kept goods flowing, and so we continue to do. And um, I, I'd like then to move into the very fundamental topic of free ports for us. Um, we've heard a lot of interest, interesting conversations about a free port um, project for Northern Ireland. Uh, as a privately owned port, we have plenty of experience in the area, and it constitutes a great opportunity for Northern Ireland uh, if there are real incentives for industry to to work with us and uh, to create a sustainable and durable um, bit of economic growth for the region. Um, we are very aware of what's happened in England with the bids now being completed and. Uh, Scotland having released in their format in the shape of green charts. So um, I'd be very keen to, to understand what the point is on uh, the Northern Irish approach to this and what's the thinking in terms of uh, links to the Scottish scheme. And I'll also conclude, is there a, uh, a, a plan or an idea around infrastructure grants and funds for the ports in Northern Ireland. This is my contribution. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, David? Uh, good morning, Madam Chairperson. You can hear me okay, yeah? Can, thank you. 
Okay. Obviously, uh, 2020 was a was a very difficult year. It was a very difficult year for everyone. So thanks to all our teams for uh, keeping everything going um, and maintaining our, our position as as a major competitive port. Um, preparations for EU exit started uh, in earnest uh, late 2019 with uh, the port beginning a, a process of reconfiguring the operational footprint to try and optimize our space landlocked as we are um, and to um, maximize flexibility because of the uncertainty that EU exit was going to bring. Uh, those actions have, uh, have, have stood us in, in good stead. Uh, there is a lot more to do as, as we navigate uh, EU exit actually here, um, and there is considerable additional investment uh, required to help facilitate that. So uh, I, I would echo um, Lauren Harbour's comments uh, regarding potential additional grant funding toward that. Um, Volume-wise, uh, 2020 was a roller coaster. Um, at, at points of the year, we were down by over 20%. Uh, the final quarter, however, came back very strongly, so pleased to confirm that the port will return a modest profit in 2020, and volumes have, have finished about 4% of, uh, of 2019. Um, in terms of how volume has been impacted by EU exit, um, given we are in the middle of a pandemic and there are so many exceptional factors at play, it's probably too soon to say definitively um, how EU exit is impacting on us. The port has seen an increase year on year. Of course, um, 2020 was down on 2019. So um, it's hard to say exactly how that's going to play out, but yeah, we, we, we are we are encouraged that we didn't fall over the proverbial uh, cliff edge that we were all somewhat terrified of, given the, the uncertainty around EU exit. Um, what I would say is is that our, our Ruru, car Ruru and Lulu carriers, they've had to uh, probably weather more of the, of the primary pain, uh, along with their customers, the hauliers, uh, in, in adjusting to, uh, to new protocols. Um, in terms of COVID-19, um, COVID-19 has obviously indirectly affected our business in all sorts of ways with uh, uh, commodity stream variations, but thankfully in terms of people, um, it, it, it has barely touched the port and, and we work very hard to make sure that that continues to be the case. Um, in terms of EU exit and, and new arrangements, what I would say is the, the GVMS system um, we were, of course, all delighted that it actually worked because it, it, it came to the table so very, very late in the day. But I think it's uh, essential that um, DARA and the EHO bodies can actually um, integrate with that. I think it's unacceptable that our, our uh, you know, sea truck, our Ruru operator, for example, uh, should, should have to field three different sources of requests uh, to, to help isolate trailers for inspection. Um, uh, a single integrated system um, would, would keep things simpler and be more helpful for them. Um, we've also been working very hard at community engagement this, this past year, and uh, we, we were truly delighted that the port was able to bring together customers, suppliers, employees, um, and of course the port itself to, to launch a COVID community Christmas fund at the end of 2020, where we successfully um, were able to make modest donations to 23 local good causes. So it was a really nice way to, uh, to finish the year. Um, picking up again on, on, on Lauren's points regarding free ports, um, Warren Point continues to actively engage with um, INI, the other ports and the local councils uh, to, to, to evaluate what, what best possible submission um, could be in, in the event that that, that that goes forward. And that's a, that's a summary of uh, Warren Point. Thanks. Okay, thank you, David. Um, Brian? Yes, uh, good morning, Madam Chair, and um, thank you for the opportunity to come and uh, speak to the committee today. Um, at Foilport, um, we've been uh, working hard in preparation for the Brexit transition, and I'm pleased to say that we have had no impact in terms of our trade flows um, which is uh, to some extent because of the nature of the work that we do here, 
uh, unlike the East Coast ports with their ferries uh, and the pressures associated uh, with that kind of trade. Um, we have had our specific challenges, but uh, perhaps not to the same extent as the others. Um, so uh, one particular issue that required a, a fair amount of effort working together with, together with DERA, uh, but it was resolved and um, all of our trade flows uh, and it's really been business as usual here, largely due to the preparations that, which we did in advance. Um, in terms of COVID, um, I would say that uh, we've been operating um, a, a kind of modified set of shift patterns to protect the workforce uh, and throughout the COVID pandemic. Um, and thankfully, um, we're pleased to say that we haven't been overly impacted by uh, COVID other than sometimes people shielding or people uh, having to isolate, but it's been uh, effectively managed and has, uh, thank goodness, um, we, we haven't suffered any, any sort of impact on our operations. So um, uh, from the, the, those two big elements, I think Foilport's experience has been uh, one of uh, reasonably positive, I would say. Um, uh, and I think that we're looking now uh, to um, really come out of this whole pandemic and Brexit piece uh, with a firm footing uh, to do our part in terms of uh, regional economic development and investment. And in that respect, that's where we are very keen on the development of the whole Freeport concept uh, for Northern Ireland. Um, and Foilport have been to the fore in terms of driving that uh, thinking forward uh, together with other stakeholders. We want to get a situation where we're not competing against each other um, necessarily and trying to find an accommodation where we can have as inclusive as possible uh, a way to uh, bring stakeholders together um, that will benefit the country. So um, in that respect, uh, I think it's fair to say that the intentions around ports and the councils um, is really on innovation rather than the traditional customs piece uh, with, associated with free ports. Um, and although there may be some longer term opportunities around the customs piece, I think it's an alignment with city data geography and the innovation led renewables green agenda that we and FOIL see where free ports could really help us uh, develop our business and support the economy. So that, that's all that I would like to say this morning. Okay, thank you. And Morris. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, committee members, um, for the invitation to give you a briefing today. So I can make my briefing uh, fairly short because uh, it's similar in many ways to the previous speakers um, from the other ports. Um, I think, in essence, it's really too early to say what the effect of the, uh, the, the latest stage of Brexit and the Northern Ireland Protocol has been because we only really have... Um, a few weeks trading to look at, but I think probably the best starting point is to, you know, to say to the committee that the role of the Port Authority is primarily that of an infrastructure provider. So we're really uh, one or two steps removed from the actual effects of Brexit and the Northern Ireland Protocol. It's the, the traders and the hauliers and, you know, the owners of cargo shipping companies are most affected. And I think maybe my colleague from Lauren is in a better position to speak on that because obviously Lauren run the ferry service as well. Um, so uh, bearing that in mind, you know, we, we have a perspective, but we're not directly involved in cargo handling or any of those things. Equally, we don't actually get involved in any of the actual checking processes at the port itself. Obviously, the DERA facility for the point of entry checking is, is we don't have any people there or anything like that. That's simply a site provided to us by DERA. Um, the operating model of the port in the early part of this year, 2021, has remained fairly stable overall. Uh, there was a huge amount of work, like other ports, in particularly the last quarter of the year 2020, because there was quite a lot of work with both DERA and with HMRC regarding the, um, you know, the establishment of the new routines. And I think I would echo the comment uh, by David that uh, the fact that from our perspective anyway, GVMS seems to have worked um, satisfactorily is, is, a, is a benefit because I think it remains a pivotal part of the whole thing. Uh, obviously, however, uh, the actual trading impacts are mostly focused on freight ferries rather than the other cargo modes, that's i.e. the ferries that run 
between England and Scotland and here, and uh, that's about 50% of our cargo overall. So, so far, it seems to be operating broadly in the steady state. Um, and, uh, but of course, we all know that you know that position is assisted by the, the presence of the various easements that are, are in place currently. Uh, so really, that concludes my remarks on the current situation in terms of the mobile protocol, etc. I just think it's too early to say I'm too early to make discern any meaningful pattern from trade. I mean, one month doesn't really say a lot in terms of that. Uh, moving then on to the other issue, which is COVID, I'll just touch briefly. Well, thankfully, again, our employees in the port have been only slightly affected. It's only been fairly, we're not been overly affected by that, just like the other ports. Uh, we've been operating in pandemic plan mode. Uh, we've obviously changed all our working patterns, etc., to protect staff. That's been number one priority. The result of that has been that, thankfully, the operating model of the port has not been much impacted at all. Trade was down at a similar level down to one point, as reported there by David. And we ourselves also saw about a 20% dip in trade in the middle of the year uh, with the various restrictions. And I think that's all I'll say in terms of the current update, other than perhaps to note that we're uh, it might be of note for the committee that we're just finishing off a very significant series of investments in re, uh, rebuilding you know, port infrastructure uh, in respect of the container facility here in Belfast. That's about a £40 million project. The container uh, facility here in Belfast is Northern Ireland's, uh, I think, sole uh, link between here and the European mainland that runs scheduled shipping services. And that, that facility required quite a lot of expenditure. And we've also expanded our roll-on, roll-off facilities. So we're just in the middle of a fairly big investment program to refresh and renew the sort of essential port infrastructure. Uh, I think I'll conclude there, Chair, if that's all right. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you to all of you for that um, sort of brief um, summary of the current situation. Um, can I just ask a, a general question, um, really, at this stage, just with regards to, obviously, the, the new arrangements which, which have come in? Um, could you really clarify the role which is being currently being carried out by councils? Obviously, a number of you have, have referred to councils in in um, your presentations, but I suppose specifically in relation to um, protocol arrangements, um, what the role and what their role is. Could I ask me, Ricardo? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, if you can hear me. Um, Typically, in, in our port, currently, uh, the council has employees that work on behalf of DERA and provide phytosanitary checks on uh, an, a, a number of vehicles, freight vehicles that are disembarked in LAR coming westbound. This happens inside our port boundary lines, also known as ISP, ISPS as a temporary solution later in the year or whenever the facility is ready they will move outside uh, our premises to uh, an area called redlands um, in, 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 in basically what they do is some vehicles uh, are earmarked by uh, te technology to go for inspection then as they are um, disembarked they are then identified by uh, staff, by DERA staff, they operate in our port, and then taken to uh, the facility, and there they are inspected and then released when um, the authorities are satisfied with the with their documentation. This happens on a random basis, and uh, the um, DERA staff, the council staff, have been back on site after a brief uh, period where they were off site. Have I answered your question? I'm just Oh, I'm not really clear what really the role of the council is and whether that's a statutory role. Uh, statutory role. Well, they do provide employees, on, and, and these employees, they, uh, they, they work on behalf of DERA. They, pro they, they do those checks at the facility. Um, more than that, it's a matter probably for the council and for DERA to answer. We, we do offer them a facility for them to do the checks, and we facilitate the transfer of those vehicles to that area. And I suppose maybe this could be a question to all of you. Um, really, what is the current level of inspections that you're experiencing? And really, this was after the grace period, um, what would you expect that to be? And I suppose then I'm looking at, at resource and what type of resource would be required in order to be able to carry out those inspections, particularly as we move towards 
unfortunately looking at um, chilled meats and, and, and meals and so on. Um, what are the potential problems which are likely to arise from all of this? I'll, I'll try and answer again. Uh, currently, there aren't that many checks. I will say it's a handful a day, uh, probably less than 10 a day. It, if uh, there, there was a number bounded about at around 1% of goods moving, but that could increase. Uh, and of course, there will be a threshold between, uh, you know, after which um, volumes could be impacted. But we have to bear in mind, certainly for our port, that those checks will happen at a facility outside our premises, so goods will move out of the port estate. So we don't quite know what the impact is going to be for us directly, as vehicles will exit the, the port estate at that point. It will be on a site of, uh, outside of our premises. So at this stage, you, you don't see any potential problems? Well, we, we can't really tell. If um, the number of checks is significant, if it's huge, it might impact the attitude of the traders to want to carry uh, the goods through here. And this is more my ferry hat uh, on my head than my Port Authority hat, if that makes sense. And is anyone else in the position to consider what potential changes might have and what the impact may have may ha that may have on, on each of the ports, no? So I'll just make a very brief additional comment and I wouldn't disagree with anything that's been said. So just uh, I think the people who could best respond to that with confidence are actually DERA themselves because I think none of us are directly involved. I mean, I think I would echo the view that at the moment it's not too much of an intervention but it is self-evident that obviously if the checking regime has to ramp up at the end of the easements then there will be additional burden on the uh, DERA staff and, and, and council staff but that at the moment is uncertain and it, but it's definitely a risk so it remains one of the sort of unknown factors but it's self-evident that that is must be a concern but I think, in, in, in truth, the people who could respond to that in, with confidence are dearer themselves. Thank you. Uh, and then just sort of generally, um, can you maybe tell me what the role has been of EU-appointed inspectors at the, port, at the ports at this stage? And what their role has been? Well, I, 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 I can tell you I, I have no direct knowledge of their role uh, here in the Port of Belfast. Anyone else? We, we, uh, we met with a, an EU representative uh, twice ahead of 1st of January. Um, that, that person visited the port to review progress of the, uh, of the contingency inspe SPS inspection centre build. Um, whilst we were made aware that, that they will continue to visit the port to liaise with DERA and Council, uh, they don't actually engage directly with any port personnel. So. Uh, we're, we're not aware of uh, precisely what, what they're doing. Okay. And is that the same situation in Lorne? And for yes. It? Yes, it is. So you don't have, there's, there's very little engagement with EU inspectors at this stage? Very limited. We heard that they came on site and they interacted mainly with uh, their border force, but we had almost no interaction with them. And uh, that was prior to the 8th of January when the easements would be uh, ending. Okay, thank you. Mr. Cannon. Okay, thank you, Ricardo, David, Brian, and Morris. You're all very welcome. Thank you for the information so far. My question relates to volumes. And I think um, David might have touched on it briefly. And I think it was I branded as well. But I want to sort of, if you look back at January uh, 2020, and obviously January now and part of February. What impact? Well, obviously we're in a pandemic, but what's the impact the protocol has had on volumes? Uh, th th this isn't a fudge. It, I think it is uh, genuinely too too soon to call. Um, the uh, the weather at the end of uh, or the weather during um, 2019 had a direct bearing, for example, on animal feed volumes coming into the port at the beginning of 2020. Uh, weather was much less favourable this year. So we have seen an increase in animal feed volume, which we believe is more to do with harvest than anything to do with EU exit. 
So yes, we're we're uh, we're up uh, year on year, but um, we're only up five percent, for example, on two thousand and nineteen volume. So I think I think it's just it's it's too soon to call, but we have not fallen off a cliff. That's for sure, and is a is a huge relief. So uh, um, I can add to that one just uh, a bit. So. Um, in terms of the, the, the volumes, obviously, that we're most concerned about would be the freight ferry volumes, the roll-on, roll-off traffic, because that's the sector of the traffic that would be most um, uh, affected by uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, we obviously are a bulk and a container port as well, and you can get short-term fluctuations in volume, but in terms of the roll-on, roll-off traffic, which is the critical part, I would suggest, uh, we are, we're also slightly up, as David is. Now, the thing about that is it's, it's very difficult on one month's trading to say anything because traditionally January can be a quiet month anyway. Um, then we had a lot of stock building. We had a trade surge undoubtedly in December where people were bringing in stuff. So we had a bit of a surge at the end of the year. So between a surge in December, a, you know, January being typically normally quiet and we did a fairly thin trading at the start uh, and we're seeing some recovery into February. So as I said, I think in my opening remarks, it's really too early to discern any um, any overall pattern, but in terms of roll-on, roll-off traffic, we are, like we're on point, seeing you know, fairly steady traffic now. R Ricardo, what's your thoughts on that? So uh, th there's two factors at play here. One is clearly Brexit, and we shouldn't forget that the, the EU exit was, in fact, 31st of January 2020. So we tend to look at 2019 as a bellwether for our trading. And the, the other factor, which is the, the, the biggest one is clearly COVID. And uh, in terms of um, EU exit, we mustn't forget that uh, we do work on a corridor which is uh, typically in parallel or in competition with the Republic of Ireland and the Dublin, Liverpool or Dublin, Oliad. And this, you know, our volumes are published, uh, freight volumes are published. We're there or about for the past two years, but this is also because the volumes into the Republic have completely tanked, and this is just freight, and they have tanked due to EU uh, rules. The second side of it is obviously the impact of the pandemic, which has it, 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 it all but stopped the tourist and passenger market, although for our corridors less so because we've been GB to Northern Ireland, we are a domestic route, so there's still a few people travelling. There are no people travelling into the Republic of Ireland, very, very few. So these are the two main factors. So yes, trade has held up, and due to the really good work that all the ports have done with the protocol and with the, the specific Northern Ireland corridor agreement, but it's also because the other routes have been impacted more, if that helps. What's your, what's your thoughts? Um, you're referring to volumes and some saying it's up and I appreciate it depends what you're shipping in or what's coming into your specific port, whether it's animal feed stuff, mm -hmm. timber, etc., not fresh produce. That's not what we're hearing from the haulage sector in regard to the, the number of lorries and trailers that's parked on the mainland UK and not getting back because of no back loads. So how can we have that volume of, of equipment sitting over there and then we still have a, a, an increase in volume of, of, of ferry transport back and forth? How does that... It, it's, it's, um, no, not for us. If I were to look at uh, you know freight volumes, the majority for us is uh, at the moment with with, uh, with 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 retail closed. It's mainly supermarket and that type of that type of trade, and that comes in and out pretty regularly. Um, yeah, it is true that uh, it, it's it's easier to go east than it is to go west. But you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that we are one-way street at the moment. No, it's it, it's fairly steady. It's certainly comparable to what it used to be. But then again, the the, the the normal forces in the market aren't at play at the moment. There's a lot missing, and that's all the hospitality and uh, and retail being closed. Has a massive impact, of course. It's it's fair to say as well. Our, the Nor Northern Ireland Irish hauliers are used to uh, uh, exiting. You know, through through Belfast, through Lorne, through Dublin, um, the, the the hauliers are exposed to a different level of pain because um, our understanding of it is is that volumes through Dublin port have collapsed 
by half, which which is profound. Um, so the 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 first hand experience that the Holliers will be having it is of course very different to what what the Northern Irish ports may, may be uh, experiencing. And, and just on that, David, why why is that why is that collapsed by half? What's your your take on that? What's the reason for that? Um, my take on that is that it's um, it's easier to come in through Northern Ireland and it's easier to exit through Northern Ireland uh, to GB. So that's what's happening. Whether that stays like that, we, we, we don't know. The other thing that we don't know yet, but we will be able to do uh, in due course an economic reconciliation on this is, is that has the loss of business in Dublin fully transferred into Northern Ireland? I don't think it has, but it, it, it's really it's really too soon to know. So, so a basic sum you're saying, uh, and this is my last point, Chair, but your basic sum is, David, that 50% could have spread throughout Northern Ireland to balance out the reduction in, in traffic, he, uh, as Ricardo said, east-west? I, I, I honestly don't know yet, but there's, there's no doubt that an amount of, of Dublin originally um, Northern Ireland traffic that chose to exit through Dublin to enter GB is now choosing to enter GB directly through Northern Irish ports. Okay. Okay. okay thank you, gentlemen. Thanks. Miss thank um, Anderson. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for, for the information that you previously sent in in your presentation this morning. And uh, Brian, could I specifically ask yourself, because I'm listening to the others uh, and I'm aware that foil port is bulk cargo operation, mainly dealing with um, dealing in commodities rather than what some of the others have talked about, the roll on, roll off operation. Um, and it's good to hear about the steady flow, I have to say, of the roll-on, roll-off operation and the increase in traffic to know there are no delays and uh, that the volumes have finished for some of you at a profit. And uh, that, that's good position to the user in and to hear about that today. But what does that mean, Brian, for Foilport with reference to Brexit? Because the last time that you were in front of the committee, I know you had talked about it being somewhat catastrophic, for instance, had uh, there not have been an arrangement uh, particularly with regards to the All Ireland nature of, yeah. uh, of 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 your work, and you were concerned about the loss of up to forty yeah. percent of your trade. Yeah, uh, that was the analysis. Had we failed, or the government failed to get a deal, uh, and it's really the protocol uh, and the agreement that was reached that uh, prevented us from having that kind of um, catastrophic outcome, as you describe. So whilst I know it, it's particularly controversial uh, and it is more impacting on the west-east, east-west trade, um, the protocol in terms of foil port uh, actually works extremely well for us. Uh, but it's because of the nature of the commodities that we're, we're dealing in and the nature of our cross-border trades. So, um, uh, you know, we have a, within the, the Northern Ireland ports, uh, you know, it, it's, it's maybe, it is different to the, to the rest. So uh, I'm not suggesting that our experience is one which is shared uh, with the others, but from our perspective, the protocol actually saved or staved off what would have been a very, very serious situation for us. Um, and we've had some limited challenges uh, in terms of dealing with the, uh, the protocol and the impacts um, you know, in terms of compliance, but those have all been addressed and uh, we've had a good rapport with the, um, with, particularly with DERA. Um, so, um, the, within the new system of the protocol, our arrangements have all worked uh, extremely well. We haven't had any difficulty in getting the trade flows out the gate. And uh, really, the liaison between our customers and stakeholders uh, within the system. Uh, we don't have the issue of the, um, the change to the easements that uh, Morris has described. Um, so, we're comfortable and confident that we can continue on uh, as we have been since January the 1st. Um, Chair, I'm conscious that as we uh, go toward the end of some of the grace periods that you have talked about maybe a need 
for an uplift in some assistance, some financial assistance to help you stay with that. And that is something we probably uh, need to return to, perhaps. Uh, we were obviously a number of us, I think the majority in the assembly, but it didn't get across the line in, in terms of supporting an extension to the transition. I think that would have been helpful for business. But just listening to all of you, you seem to have done a, a great deal of preparation. Uh, in advance of whatever was going to happen at the end of the year. And it's a pity that other maybe businesses didn't do the same. I would like to mention just the commentary from, from any of you around the issue of free ports. Brian, you know that I have concern uh, in relation to free ports because um, I'm concerned that they mainly relocate as opposed to jobs. And so the innovation that you talked about, Brian, I think maybe it's a committee that would be something that we would like to explore because I don't think that you can really talk about free ports and not deal with the custom issue that you were saying, well, that's not what your focus is at. And I appreciate uh, completely where you're coming at this from. But free ports would most likely exacerbate regional imbalance and undermine local and, and all Ireland trade if, we were, if they were dealt with in the way that they have been dealing with. We know in March of last year, I think it's something that uh, our committee might want to get their hands on, because the European Parliament did adapt a report calling on the European Commission uh, to bring forward a proposal for the urgent phasing out of free ports in the EU. And there was a special committee set up of cross-group MEPs. Uh, it was called Tax 3. Uh, and pointing out the risks because you know that that committee dealt with issues that I know, Brian, you want to see in the foil port or anywhere else, but there are reality of free ports that need to be dealt with. And that's tax evasion, tax trade and money laundering, criminality. So whilst there are currently 80 free ports in the EU, all of them must comply with EU rules, in, uh, including state aid rules. So in relation to our situation with the protocol, I think it is something that the, this committee should return to. So uh, we're all familiarised and aware and we don't walk into a situation without having all the facts on the table because no political party would want to see either, you know, tax evasion, money laundering, criminality emanating from any of this. And I know, Brian, certainly that's something that you do not want to see um, happening in, in court, in the foil court. No, absolutely, Martina. I mean, I don't think any of the ports, uh, you know, in the country would would be seeking to go down that route. But perhaps the, the, the most pressing issue around free ports in Northern Ireland is the question of whether a free port in Northern Ireland is actually compatible with the protocol. So, um, you know, I know that, uh, like, you can always get legal advice that tells you what you want, but there are legal advices, as I understand it, in the system, which are basically saying that um, the, the, the protocol may not allow for a customs-led free port within Northern Ireland. Now, that's something which could be uh, argued or whatever. And I think that what is less controversial is by looking at the innovation, uh, green energy, you know, that whole move towards decarbonisation. I think that if we were to use the free port policy as a, a, as a stimulus in that direction, in line very much with the city deals, uh, working with the universities and the councils, I think we'd have a much more joined up policy approach to economic development. Um, and I think that in that sense, and this is what we've been trying to do with the ports and the, the stakeholders, is to get that um, alignment to the city deals uh, in a way which Treasury have already agreed the kind of um, need for growth within Northern Ireland because of our disadvantages and all of those things. So I, I think actually we could come up with a very good um, alignment where policy can be comparable or, or compatible with the protocol in a way which is politically acceptable across uh, all of the constituencies and opinions within Northern Ireland. And that's what we're trying to do. Uh, Chair, I think as a committee, we would like to be kept um, across that because, Brian, from get-go, I was very mindful that anything that was being suggested around the, the whole issue of customs was going to be incompatible with the protocol and we were going to end up in a hiding to nothing with that, really, with regards to the protocol. So we have to make sure we can do nothing in the Assembly and rightly so that is incompatible uh, with the protocol so we don't want to do any damage 
to um, anything that's already there. But as you already said, you know, if you had it went down another route, you would have had 40% of your own business being damaged as a consequence of um, maybe another outcome to Brexit. So let's explore that with you. I wouldn't mind getting more information around that innovation that you talk about. Of course, there's great opportunities with the inclusive growth and city deals. And I know as the council, we're dealing with that as others are dealing with it well. In their area, let's see what you're talking about and making sure that there is that alignment and compatibility and innovation on where we can maximise that. Of course, we should, but we cannot do anything that's going to uh, be incompatible with the protocol. And the free port, some of the suggestions that had come out were certainly incompatible with the protocol. Thank you, Brian, and thank you for the rest of you for, that, uh, for the outline today. Okay, thank you. Ms. Kimmins? Thanks, Chair, and, and thank you all um, for for your presentation this morning. Uh, just, I suppose, regarding Warren Point, and, and I'm pleased, uh, David, to hear that the port ended strongly, particularly after such a very challenging year for everybody. Um, and I do think it's important people realise that the ports are trust ports so that profits can be invested back into the local economy, and I think that's more important now than ever. Um, you know, we, we know there's funding there, and, and you've said that um, you may be able to get certain projects done within this financial year, which could be a huge boost to the port, um, particularly you know in a challenging period like this. So I would be urging the minister to really prioritise looking at what ports can do with the funding that is available. Can you elaborate a wee bit on what um, what these projects, if if approved, would mean for the ports if they were given the green light? Because I think you know time is very much of the end. So anything we can do to to help with that, I think, is is important. Well, well, more in point does have, have capital shovel ready projects uh, ready to go. Um, and of course, it, it's not just enhancing the port infrastructure then, um, because any money spent on a port, the, the, all the ports act as uh, economic generators. So uh, a pound invested in the port is, is likely to bring ultimately, you know, two, three, four pounds back into the economy. So any immediate grant investment available for Warren Point, for example, uh, will result in potentially, you know, supporting 100 construction jobs, um, will lead to new full-time equivalent jobs, will help us potentially uh, retain new potential uh, EU exit business that, that, that comes our way. There's, there's, there's just such a list of, of, of benefits in, uh, in striking while the iron's hot. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Thank you, David. And what about for, for the rest of you as well? Is is that something um, that that you think would be helpful too? I'll try and answer first. Uh, I would say absolutely yes. And uh, speaking as uh, the general manager of a port, which is privately owned, um, we would love to have the opportunity to invest more of our own money in the port with the help of grants from local government, because not only this generates immediate benefits but it also allows uh you know local local growth local jobs um technology and f things focus on decarbonization we we cannot wait to put more of our money in it if we show about if we see a vote of confidence from from the government in this can i can i just um, what what we're looking to do in foil, we also have shovel ready and um, oven ready or whatever way you want to describe it, uh, projects ready to go, which are essentially around baseline core infrastructure um, so that we can be ready to sell our capacity to the marketplace. So um, these are, um, in our case, we're looking to uh, connect to the grid so that we can bring in large scale um, industrial green activities into the harbour um, state, which will um, be complementary to the, the, the city deal narrative and all those things that are already ongoing. And I would argue that what the port have looked to do is actually provide infrastructure which should be funded by the government. I mean, it, it is baseline infrastructure that we're looking for that makes ready, uh, you know, the fact that we can go out and market this, this capacity. So um, we would urge the committee to, to take a very strong interest in, in how we look at um, the placement of these grants in terms of the uh, bang for your buck that you're going to get. But uh, it is something we've been working on for maybe about 18 months. So when the call comes up now, can you spend this within the next number of months or the next couple of weeks? We can absolutely do that. Okay, thank you, Brian. 
Well, just from uh, Belfast perspective, we're we're already in the process of upgrading a lot of our facilities. But all I can do is echo the comments of my colleagues before that, you know, the the infrastructure investment made by ports, you know, do need supported by government. You know, inland connectivity is a factor, and also you know dealing with the the effects of of Brexit as well. And uh, so we're very interested to keep in touch on that. Okay, no, thank you, thank you, all, and and that's that's really useful, I think, because as I said earlier, time is very much of the essence. We're very close to the end of the financial year, so the fact that there's shovel ready projects right, ready to go that could play a huge part in in the recovery, let alone anything else, um, from what we're dealing with, I think is is crucial. So, you know, it's something we would be urging. I would, I, well, I certainly would be urging the minister to to take serious consideration of. Uh, would chair, could we maybe look at um? some urgent correspondence to the minister um, you know surely it's better that we're looking at investment of funds um, into these much needed projects rather than money going back to Westminster just something we could do as a committee put that suggestion forward um, yeah, we can have a discussion in relation to uh, the session. That's no problem. Okay, just one other question. Um, it was just around traffic management and how has it been affected at the ports? Um, and how you're looking to maybe improve them? Um, I suppose, I suppose the implications of the grace periods and, and how that would impact the ports as well. So that's just my final. Well, just to, uh, Belfast, sorry, David, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I was going to say, in, in practice, and in, in, in more in point. Um, Movements out of GB um, slowed down considerably at the start, so there, there, there was no congestion a eh, because there were so few SPS checks, you know, a tiny amount, and and uh, b there was actually very little rural traffic coming in, um, and of course because of unfettered access access to GB, uh, traffic arriving into the port, you know, flowed freely onto the ferry and away, and of course the the reconfiguration that we had done and the additional uh, space that we had created. Was there in any case to to to, to absorb it, any any sort of net uh, increases in volume? So, um, thankfully, we we haven't seen any any congestion yet. Uh, but we have to keep working on that, obviously. Uh, well, similarly in Belfast, there have been no discernible effects on traffic flows under the current regime. But I think, as David has pointed out, it's it's early days, and we did commence January with about two weeks of fairly thin trading. On rule on rule off traffic. Same for us. Okay, no, no, thank you. Yes, well, that's that's good to know as well. But that, that's really all I have this morning. But thanks very much for your time. Well, thank you, Mr. Beggs. Hello. Um, th thank you all for painting the picture uh, of how things are at present. Um, you seem to be saying that containerized traffic hasn't been impacted um, and that, that you as a ports provide the infrastructure and that any pain and, and detail difficulties has been experienced by there's your customers, the, the hauliers rather than you yourselves. Would that be a reasonable summary? Yes, from my perspective, yes. But also not just um, not just uh, the hauliers, it's also it's really the owners of the cargo as well. So it, 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 the real effects translate up and down the supply chain. It's the owners of the goods uh, in the first instance who are responsible for making the declarations and then the hauliers obviously carry it and then the shippers carry the, the trucks. So it's actually the whole way along the supply chain is where the principal effects are felt. Okay. That, that, I think that's very valuable to, for you to uh, acknowledge that because someone who doesn't uh, recognize that may come away from this thinking everything's okay. Um, now, would, I, would you also agree that it's rural road traffic, which is, tends to be time sensitive, um, products perhaps with shelf life, uh, the agri-food industry, are those the, the most sensitive items that you see being transmitted across the RIC, which there is potential huge losses um, to, to businesses and hauliers if there is undue delays, would that be correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. Th thanks for that. Um, you've also indicated that that uh, you believe that some of the delays and problems at Dublin and uh, some of the northern uh, carriers moving to to um, Ryan Larne or Ryan Belfast, and that that may well have 
kept your your, your topic up a little bit. Um, so my question there is to Ricardo. Ricardo, um, PNORIC, uh, I take it you're also responsible for the Dublin uh, Liverpool as well as uh, Larne uh, at Carn Ryan. Is that correct? Yeah, it's not me directly, but I've got good um, good information on that. If that, yeah. So are are you picking up what hauliers are? Uh, some of the traffic coming into Northern Ireland Ruru is as a result of diversion from Dublin because of the problems there? For certain. Okay. And the problems there is because of the SBS rules, which have yet to be introduced here. Is that correct? Potentially, yes. Um, the, 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 it's not the only problem, but that certainly causes a, a, an issue. Uh, we mustn't forget that, again, there's a lot of uh, businesses that are not trading, so this isn't a normal we have all the COVID restrictions that also hamper the, 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 the overall traffic, but certainly it has affected much less this corridor than the middle corridor or the southern corridor. Okay. In, in terms of the, um, the east-west corridor uh, from Northern Ireland, then, uh, I understand that groupage is, is an, there's an issue with groupage uh, because of the level of bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. uh, is there uh, what percentage of groupage is coming through compared to what would normally come through? Uh, that's a hard one to uh, to cover because even as P and O, we are in the shipper, so we not necessarily know what's in the containers. But it wouldn't be a wild assumption to say that there has been a big impact on groupage due to the bureaucracy involved. But you know, quantifying it will be difficult because we don't see what's in the container. Okay. So that is lots of smaller pallets or even individual parcels which are going direct to customers. So, so yeah. potentially many, many, many people are, are being impacted. In terms of then the uh, restrictions that have come in in terms of preventing, um, I dare say, uh, 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 restricting animal movement down to, to guide dogs, um, requiring, requiring uh, uh uh, pet passports, etc. Uh, seed potatoes. Uh, how much seed potatoes would have previously come in? Would that have been many loads? Or it's hard to say. Uh, at the moment, the volumes are so subdued that you know, in general, general cargo. That it, it's hard to say. I think uh, you know, COVID might be masking the true impact of it. So, if we release, you know, as we might be released. Uh, from COVID restrictions at the same time as the easements are ending, that might be a problem, but it's very hard even for me to, to, to gauge that. It would be good to talk to the hauliers, so they, they should make representation to this. They will have a better, a better, a far better view on this. So again, have you no knowledge of uh, the impact on garden centres or is just all plant products ceased? No, I, I wouldn't have a meaningful, a meaningful contribution to making that one uh, because we look on aggregate volumes again we don't see what's in the containers okay okay I, I think it, it's been very helpful but i think it's also important that the committee realizes just as you said there you have a limited knowledge and that there's lots of things that are in play mm -hmm. and uh my final question is the the um, exemptions are due to come to an end on the first of april um uh how do you think that will impact the volume and uh, the level of delays compared to Dublin? Should uh, should they come in on the first of April? It's a difficult one because uh, again, it depends on what the total volume of trade is uh, is flowing through through the ports. And we, although we we withstood the you know the the eighth of January quite well, should there be more? checks and more volume at the same time, you could potentially see an issue uh, which is not that far from what happened between Dublin and Liverpool. Okay. Thank you very much. It's been very helpful. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. Yeah, thanks, Chair, and thanks for the presentations. Um, just a couple of points. Obviously, and I appreciate what Mr. Begg said about limited, having limited information, but the ports are the first call in terms of the overall economy because I remember we visited Belfast Port way back a number of years ago and they were the first ones to pick up the downturn in the economy in terms of the volumes and stuff coming onto the island. So it, it's a key product in relation to that. But I just want to talk about, clearly you're saying there the volumes, be it right across the board in terms of all the ports operations, 
they're, they're steady and they haven't been impacted. But you clearly had your post on, and then unfortunately, COVID has hit us. In, in terms of your overall business plan and where you are at now, and it's, it's right across the board to, to all of you, is one that's speaking that. In addition to where you're, your actual business plan and trying to deal with COVID and your post Brexit plan, would you like to just expand a wee bit on that, where you are in relation to the, your overall business plan? Or are you not getting the right sense for it because things won't happen within the last six or eight weeks and, and, and it's, it's hard to gauge that? Well, I can start from Belfast, and the answer is exactly as you've just described. The, the port industry typically does see sort of month on month fluctuations in traffic. So we would never try to gauge traffic levels or a pattern uh, from one short period of six weeks. Uh, that's, I think I made that point right at the very, very start. I mean, approximately so far, it looks to be it's running roughly an expectation on freight traffic, but I think. As David mentioned earlier on, there's an element of displacement from Dublin that's maybe boosting that. So there are just too many uncertain moving parts, including COVID. So I, I would say, you know, we would really have to reserve our position and say that we can't really give you a, a discernible view on what the, cert, the current situation is and won't be able to until we have uh, a longer spell of trading to look at. I, 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 I do absolutely agree that the ports are... Uh, a, a very useful barometer of, of of the overall economy. I think in terms in terms of war and point, our our key strategic focus more recently has been on maintaining and developing um, capacity, capability, and efficiency. Um, because you know, sev seven or eight weeks ago, not none of us knew, none of us could have known exactly how the you know EU exit Brexit was actually going to play out. Mm. Uh, was there going to be a hard day, hard crash? We, we just didn't know where we were going to be. So um, you know, on 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 that on that basis, it's you know, we we start now to to regroup and reevaluate and see where 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 the where the opportunities and threats are and and see how we can best dovetail uh, you know our our investment and resources to 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 meeting the demands of the local economy because ultimately, I mean, ports enjoy derived business. It, it, it is those other components of the supply chain that will determine how busy the port is. It's not a case of you know, build a port and the, and the volume will come. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the supply chain that, that will generate that volume. We have to try and make sure that we don't hamper um, the flow of that supply chain. Um, so that's, so that's, that, that's really, really where we are. And uh, you know, with, with COVID overlaid on top of everything else, it's terribly difficult. You know, it, it is a concern that GB... Seemingly, were as 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 ill prepared as, as they were for the the, the Northern Ireland first of January change. Um, so it begs the question: How prepared are they going to be for first of July, and how is that likely to impact on overall uh, supply chain? You know, including ourselves. So um, you know, it's 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 let's watch this space, and and uh, of course we we continue to liaise with all the government agencies because. We're not. We're not. We can't say that we're a hundred percent clear on what what the final shape of this is going to be because we're not. Um, yeah. So we uh, we we just have to keep doing our homework and, and keep trying to stay one one step ahead of, of further potential change. Yeah. No, fair enough. And would you like to comment or Ricardo? No. Yeah, well, our biggest impact has been on the tourist market, which has all but disappeared, and that would have been a big big uh, chunk of our business in terms of, you know, passenger freight in general, not necessarily just tourists. And um, interestingly, uh, Brexit doesn't really affect that in any way, but it does affect us now because of COVID. Yeah. So our focus at the moment is to uh, plan for the re-emergence of passengers traveling on our ships, and that's more linked to the vaccines than anything else. Of course, then we have to you know, the planning that was paused at the end of 2019 or early 2020 uh, for the strategic investment in the port now can resume, but having more clarity on free ports and uh, impact on other potential checks that will certainly, uh, you know, be a factor on our decision making. So, no, and I appreciate the answers. I mean, I, I asked in the context because at some point, you know, we're talking, we're discussing now an economic recovery plan, but my main point now, as far as this committee is concerned, I mean, 
clearly there's money there and we don't want it to go back to Westminster if there's an opportunity to spend money. In yes. terms of an ask of the committee, I mean, does, you know, you, you talked about, and, and Morris was talking about capital projects earlier on, I mean, and that is some sort of intern element of the reports. What, what can we do in terms of money that's uh, available or, or support from the committee? Um, what, what would be your asks in terms of trying to access some of that funding that's there? It, it doesn't matter if it's COVID fund. It happens to be COVID fund at the minute. We know there's a loan, there's a loan system there for the, for the ports. But just as an ask of the committee, can you throw out some ideas or, or you just your views on that, please? Well, the, the, there are certain commercial sensitivities of, of me saying ex exactly where, where, where our weaknesses might be and, and where we'd like, like to sort of receive additional funding. But we, we have submitted to DFI uh, you know, a comprehensive business case um, across you know, six streams of potential funding, which, which all you know, dovetail into a single project, which we, can't, which we know we can get spent uh, by the end of March. So uh, uh, the DFI... Uh, are, are in possession of, of that information. Anybody else like to comment? Hello, Morris? No? Uh, well, Charlie? look, just we're also in discussion with DFI about, about funding, but I mean, I think as David says, a lot of these things are subject to commercial confidentiality but we you know but i think we can be assured that we keep a, an active line with dfi officials on this no and, and listen it's, it's not I, I'm, I'm not a, i'm not trying to i'm not trying to acquire any more information all we know what there's, there's there's money's available and i'm sure we as committee members will try and assist if that's the case and i asked it in, in that context it's not you know i understand the commercial sensitivities and know the committee we, we're trying to encourage you know, people to to bid for as much money, each department to bid for as much money as they can to assist businesses. And I asked it only in that context. So, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't ask you to go into any other sensitivity in relation to that. But uh, just, just my final point, because there's a lot of questions that's been asked and answered in relation to volumes and everything else. I understand some part of the granting of an Office of Transit status and an authorised economic operator. Could you explain what sort of advantages that brings and do all ports have this, or can you can you respond to that, please? Well, I, I can I can make a start is is about the best I can do in that one. So Belfast Harbour is an authorised economic operator, and um, basically uh, the, the the basic regime is that when goods come into a port, they have to come in under customs control in some form or another, be it under temporary storage or be it under. Uh, the pre lodgement model, and if you have an authorised economic operator status, in my belief, anyway, that that streamlines uh, that process. So that's uh, the AEO side. The Office of Transit is a slightly more difficult one to answer, and the reason for that is the issue of scale, because um, transit conventions are where goods are moved, say, from Northern Ireland through a third party to the European Union. Uh, traditionally, we didn't see a huge amount of direct traffic directly from Northern Ireland to the European Union through the roll-on, roll-off methodology. It would be normally through containers. So that is one of those areas where it's too early to say, because until we see the new trading patterns settle out, we do not know what the impact of that will be. But in theory, it's an important component of making sure that you get uh, free movement of goods. But if you can imagine, in the previous world that we lived in, it was kind of Free flow straight, mm -hmm. and GB. To, and now, and that, and the patterns we were informed by the carriers, by the way, because we don't have direct information on this that we could actually place reliance. That was quite a small amount of traffic, but that might change in the future. So that, that's kind of a work in progress. I know that maybe not an entirely clear answer, but it is it is very much a work in progress at the moment. In, in the case of War Point, we, we upgraded. Uh, to the AEOC status, um, because to, to use a metaphor, if, 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 you're, if you're going to stay in a five-star hotel, you know it's going to have a nice restaurant and it's going to have a swimming pool and all the rest of it. Um, anybody considering um, using Warren Point Port as a, as, as, a, as a discharge destination will know that we have you know, um, the, the, the best of customer arrangements in place. You know, you do, there is an assurance there to any potential customers so we, we, we did that. There's also certain benefits to the port.
because you then achieve a certain level of professionalism, um, the actual liabilities that, that the port has to, has to hold uh, or the reserves against liabilities that the port has to hold can, will, are in practical terms reduced. So there, there is an investment in getting to that standard, but you know, there, 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 there are benefits that come back. Also, in terms of Office of Transit, previously Belfast was the only port that had Office of Transit status in terms of origin and destination. So again, it, for the benefit of our customers, and we're not sure how much it's likely to be used, it means that anybody who, who any cargo that has been involved in a third country or it's on its way to a third country, um, you know, can, can use Warren Point without, without having to go to Belfast to get paperwork filled in. So again, it's, it, it's about trying to offer best possible customer service. Okay, thank you. Just sure, that, yeah, that's me. Thank you very much. Thanks for the presentation, Chandler. Thank you, um, Ms. Kelly, finally. Sorry, Chair. Thanks very much, everyone. Uh, my question, Chair, will be brief. It was just in relation to the projects and uh, whether or not any of your financial projects uh, and business cases relied in the past upon EU funding. Um, that's all. Uh, well, Belfast, I, I think we can go first. Um, I, I, I can't answer that exactly, but not since about the year 1990. I, I think the last the last uh, EU funding that Warren Point secured, and I, I could be wrong on this. I think it was around two thousand and six. Okay, it was just to get some uh, level of clarity as to whether or not you know any projects uh, were at, uh, that there was a gap potentially in funding that would have to be filled, you know, from the coffers here. No, no, there there, there, are, no, there are no current projects that would present gaps of that nature. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. And at this stage, we actually have Morris and um, and David on. So can I thank you both um, for attending this morning? Um, it is still is the desire of the committee to be able to visit both of um, both um, ports at, at some stage, COVID permitting. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to do that in the not too distant future. So thank you very much for your time this morning. No, thank you. Thank you. Hi, members. Um, just to follow up on that, obviously Liz had suggested perhaps we write to the Minister just in relation to infrastructure projects. I suppose it would be quite difficult for us to give a, a sort of a blanket support in relation to any of that because we don't know the detail of it and, and, and obviously there, they were um, confidential um, business cases applying to a lot of that. But I suppose we could just reflect the fact that we had met with them today and we were aware that they had bids in and I suppose... Um, that we were sort of broadly supportive of, of, of the work of the ports, but um, without knowing the detail of it, I think it would be quite difficult for us. Yeah, sure. Even just the, the goals, that it's, it is prioritised because I think it's, you know, we're, we're, time's running out. So it's just to, to even highlight how important it is that the department deals with this fairly quickly and that we, if we can get financial support to them, we do. Okay, this is just really with respect to the whole issues around COVID, I'm, I'm guessing, too. Okay. Sure. Sure. <laughs> Mr. Boyle and then Mrs. Kelly. Go, no, thanks, Chair. I, I mean, I appreciate it. And sorry, Dolores, if you want to go in, Dolores, you're okay. You want to go first? Go ahead, go ahead. No, no, no Chair, I, would, I, I agree with Liz. I would ask in, in, in respect of the Brexit challenges and obviously clearly COVID challenges. I, I mean, I, I understand there's commercial sensitivities, but I'm sure there may be some kind of package in there that would support the ports in relation to those two measures. Um, I would look at that you know, in respect of those two measures, you know. Kelly? Uh, sorry, Chair, mine was just a more general point. I mean, uh, obviously we're in the last few weeks now of any potential bid for uh, end of year funding. And I just wonder, is there any merit in uh, asking the Finance Committee to look at what departments have returned very late on and whether it should be there, better financial management throughout the year? Because um, I understand that some departments are returning substantial sums that potentially infrastructure and others could have made use of earlier in the year had there been a heads up. But, but I do appreciate it's been a very difficult year for all ministers coping with uh, the pandemic and, and the funding streams from that. But I just wonder, should we should we write to the Finance Committee just to express some concerns that we are hearing uh, that there are um, 
um, some organisations and companies that could avail of uh, monitoring round funding, but that it's much too late when it comes to the January round and uh, an earlier alert system would be preferable. Okay, moving then, and I'm very mindful actually because I know that Glenn has to leave at a quarter past twelve, so we don't have a, a huge amount of time. Um, so if we can move then on to our the next item, which is um, our presentation from um, Retail NI, and again sort of current issues. And paper is tabled at page forty three. Again, Hansard will record the meeting. Um, we'll welcome Glenn via Starleaf, uh, who's the chief executive of. Um, Retail line. Then you're very welcome. Good morning, Chair. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, present to you this morning. Um, I very much want to look at the role of the Department of Infrastructure in regard to COVID recovery, and I suppose where we are with the protocol, and of course with the pandemic and the protocol, many of our members are facing almost a perfect storm of challenges uh, and you know we've talked about cliff edges i don't know how many cliff edges uh, our economy can fall off but i think it's important both with the pandemic and indeed the protocol that we adopt a solution-based approach and try and work through uh, many of the problems and challenges uh, that we face and perhaps if i can take just maybe touch upon the role of the department of infrastructure in terms of COVID recovery. Um, I sort of tabled the paper and give a bit of context and again, some of the solutions that uh, we would like the department to focus on, not just in terms of COVID recovery, but the rebuilding and restructuring of our economy generally. And it is worth pointing out the Department of Infrastructure will be a key part of the new High Streets Task Force. So it, it will have a key role in terms of uh, helping to recover from uh, COVID and the impact it's had on our high streets, but also helping to shape that 21st century vision for our town and, and city centres. I think it, it's worth, I think, pointing out that, you know, that the pandemic has literally tore up all the rules in relation to uh, our high streets. It's accelerated, uh, I think, in many cases, the pace of change for our high streets. Uh, not all of that clearly is good. Uh, it's directly contributed to a number of large retailers closing their doors or moving 100% uh, online. But I think it is very much, uh, uh, we now need to be, uh, I think, in a position where the new High Street Task Force focuses on the four R's in relation to a regeneration framework for our high streets. And that's repositioning, re reinventing, rebranding and restructuring. Uh, and I think key to all of that is developing the concept of localism. And what that means is repurposing our town and city centres to make them unique hubs in the heart of our local community. I think one thing that we've seen during this pandemic is that, uh, and Dave, you're still seeing this, is that because of obviously the guidelines and the regulations and with the huge growth of more people working from home, that means they're staying local, they're buying local, and indeed, when hospitality was open, they were socialising local as well. And that obviously presented an opportunity for many of those traders to sort of try and capture a lot of those people. But that obviously has come at the expense of some of our larger cities and principally Belfast city centre as well. And that poses some interesting challenges for uh, our transport system. You know, when we get to the other side of this pandemic, um, I think that certainly the rule of the office will have to change. I think we'll see more hybrid working. I think we'll see home working, uh, not necessarily uh, the option for every business because there are some sectors who can't have home working and retail obviously is one of those. Well, what does that mean for public transport? What does that mean for investing in infrastructure in our local, in our many of our local towns? And you referenced the city deals in the, in the last presentation, of course, you know, the key thing with these city deals is making sure they deliver in terms of a modern infrastructure and are a catalyst for regeneration. And I think that very much this localism agenda, which we're very much keen to advance, is not just about supporting local, supporting independent retailers. It's about changing the leadership model 
in many of our local villages, towns uh, and cities. Uh, and it's, it's making sure that many of the members that we represent, many of the, the broader business community and civic society are playing a full role in terms of shaping their towns, but also shaping the recovery as well. I mean, some of the highlights that we would want to engage with the Minister on, we fully support the idea of the establishment of an infrastructure commission. I think with Scotland uh, going for a very much interested in exploring a five-year moratorium on, on superstore applications. And we've seen uh, only this week, sadly, um, yeah, Antrobute and Abbey Council grant a large out-of-town superstore, completely ignoring the town centre first uh, planning policy, which the Department of Infrastructure oversees, but also ignoring the impact that will have on many struggling independent retailers. And let's not forget the large supermarkets have done exceptionally well during this pandemic. Other practical things like devolving car parking, uh, and devolving on-street car parking to the local councils, with giving the councils greater responsibility over local councils. I mean, we're dealing with a practical issue with our members in Newry and Lisburn, where uniquely that those two uh, cities, obviously Belfast has this as well, they have paid on-street car parking. And in order to get that changed, they've got to go through a very lengthy process, engage with the minister. And in any other part of the UK, this would be sorted by the local council rather than trying to get a government minister to intervene in terms of getting changes to car parking in Lisbon and Belf uh, sorry, Lisbon and Newry city centres. And very much they want this change to help with the recovery of their uh, city centres. I think not that we really do need to push on the high speed or certainly improve rail journey uh, between Belfast and Dublin. Um, you know, a few years ago that was a very left field idea. Now it's very much a mainstream idea with obviously the Irish government putting in as a, as a major uh, priority uh, and looking at the economic viability of this. But we also need to focus on the need to invest in many of our rural towns. Uh, and many of those rural towns have an opportunity um, to bounce back from COVID because they, as I've said, they have captured so many of these uh, uh, local people who are working from home and are, are maybe doing a bit more with local independence, and maybe there is an opportunity there. But at times, many of those small towns and, and villages, many of our members in those towns and villages feel very left behind with the, the city deal, you know, even the very term city deal. And we've got to ensure that we uh, have very much these city deals work for all parts of Northern Ireland. And obviously, we, in that context, reviewing obviously rural transport connectivity is crucially important as well. So I think the Department of Infrastructure has a key role to play in, in all this, but I mean obviously things like the the, the list of, of big projects like York, York Street, A6, A5, the transport hubs, all of those things, I know that there were in there about these might need to be renewed because obviously COVID has changed things. Um, I still think that those are our priorities along with our, our small towns and villages. And of course, I mean, I think very much in terms of a general point on the economy, I was very struck about what the, the health minister said a few weeks ago when he talked about the importance of the health service and the new vision for the health service not being returned to where the health service was in January 2020, but doing something different and better. And I think that's very much what we need to be with our economy. There's no point us going back to just where we were in infrastructure as well in January 2020. We need to do something bigger, bolder. And I think we have a we need a broader vision of how we can make Northern Ireland an ecosystem of innovation. Just turning to uh, where we are with the, the pandemic, I think there's absolutely no doubt that we need to adopt a solution-based approach and have a laser-like focus on what the solutions are to uh, the many challenges with the, the protocol. There's no doubt that we need uh, we do need uh, a further extension in the grace periods. Um, obviously, we're facing one this week. Um, and I think that, you know, it's not just about extending these grace periods just for the sake of it or kicking the can down the road. We do need long-term solutions to uh, these challenges. Uh, and I think one of those solutions has been pushed very strongly is the Swiss model. So we'll, it will be interesting to see uh, tomorrow, where tomorrow's meeting moves forward. Um, and uh, we'd be certainly keen to input into that meeting. We haven't been asked as yet. I, but I think it is in on the 
UK and EU showing continued flexibility. It's about ensuring that we have a supply chain. And just touching upon what uh, our colleagues in the port said, that you know a supply chain which obviously provides stability, certainty, that avoids cost, avoids delay. Um, and I think that that is crucially important for obviously our retail sector being a key part of the supply chain and the just-in-time supply chain process. And I think that you know we, we sometimes lose sight of what we want to achieve with all of this. And you know we get into very technical, we get into a very technical, uh, jargonistic um, process, which really for us, it's about ensuring that we don't add to hard work and families grocery belt. We make sure that there's a full range of products uh, and we don't add to hard work and families uh, problems that you know obviously come through a lot with the pandemic. And I think just really a conclusion to the protocol, I think that there is an emerging consensus across business and certainly across our retail and wholesale uh, members that the best outcome for the overall supply chain would be the implementation of a digital solution from source to shelf covering the logistical and technical requirements for ensuring compliance to the legislative requirements. I think this would require a more effective and efficient process through the supply chain and limit the costs and burden to the industry, which currently is a very complicated uh, process. But it's also about ensuring that we have frictionless good movements and maintain the availability and price of food products uh, across the NI market. So I think that's been a quick sort of scoot across the uh, houses in relation to a, a lot of these uh, issues. But as I've said, it is a, a perfect storm of challenges for our retail sector. But I, I, I do believe that uh, the, the Department of Infrastructure has an absolutely central role in terms of recovery, the new High Streets Task Force, and playing its, making sure its voices are ensuring that we have a supply chain and a logistics operation what delivers for Northern Ireland. Thank you, Madam. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, and you're absolutely right whenever you say that we are now in a perfect storm, but we're also sort of nearly 12 months now into the pandemic and the impact obviously that that's had on our local streets and, and high streets particularly has been um, quite devastating and I suppose, um, we, I suppose we can be very thankful for some of the, the, the independents who have stayed strong throughout that um, and I look even at my own local town there we've got wardens and knots who, um, who have worked throughout um, um, this, this very difficult time um, You've said that you, you're very keen then, obviously, speaking to your members, that they want to have an, uh, an integral role in trying to shape the recovery. What does that look like from retail and I's perspective? Sorry, you, you look up there. Can you just repeat your last question, Chair? Just with regards to your members have said that they would like to have a role in trying to shape the recovery. Um, what does that look like from retail and I's perspective? You know, what, what would that role actually be? Well, I, I think it's, I mean, I think the one thing that we have to change, whether it's the programme or government or whether it's the new High Streets Task Force, the one big change that I think the executive has to do this time, it needs to change how it views business and broader civic society. You know, not just see them as consultees, but see them as full partners. And that's why it's important that the programme or government is very much not just seen as a deal between five political parties, that it's seen as a broader with civic society, with business, trade unions, and so on. So it's important that you know we move from seeing the people who we represent as as just consultees, but see them as partners with growth and partners in terms of arriving at co-designed solutions. And that's why I think it's important that this new high streets task force has a key role to play. So the business and trade union representatives and, and voluntary sector representatives that are on this are there as co-equal partners with the Department of Infrastructure. And I think that they will play an increasingly important role in co-designing uh, solutions that we face. Uh, and I do believe that I am optimistic. Yes, we will see a very different high street um, at the end of this, but I, I am optimistic that we will see a very different high street. It will one that will be very much an ecosystem of lots of different types of business, not just retail and hospitality. And you know, I've said there about you know stripping away the jargon and fundamentally what do we want to achieve for our high streets? Make them fun, family friendly places that people want to visit 
um, and create that experience for it. So I think that that is absolutely key. And you know, they make them green, make them fat as well, make them green places. Um, and the role of public transport is so important in that. You know, obviously, as it is uh, making sure that we have strategies for people who want to walk, who want to cycle. Um, and obviously, public transport, it's making sure public transport is people's first option rather than their last option. Alongside that, making sure there is affordable and accessible uh, car parking as well. So, so I think it's about getting the balance of all that and making sure that we have our town and city centres about moving people rather than just cars. You've made a number of suggestions in your paper. Um, one in particular is, as with Scotland, we need a five-year moratorium on out-of-town superstore applications. Um, obviously, planning can be quite slow anyway, um, so that moratorium may happen reg regardless of a policy. Um, have you any data which um, has reflected any success with regards to that, even be it Scotland or elsewhere, um, for recovery of, of town centres? Well, I, 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 I think that firstly, the, um, sorry, I'm just going to, uh, can you hear me okay? I, I think that, the, sorry, I'm getting a, a lot of feedback from you. Hello? We can hear you. Hiya. Uh, well, I think that firstly, because the Department of Infrastructure, sorry, I can't hear. I'm getting a huge amount of feedback. I can't. It must, it must be coming from your end, Lynn. Uh, how's that? Well, that seems a bit better, but I, I, I think that, you know, obviously the Department of Infrastructure sets this policy. In, in relation to um, planning, so it does it 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 has an important voice in all this, and obviously, it councils do have a key role in terms of uh, granting planning permission. But I, I mean, one of the key reasons why Northern Ireland has the highest shop vacancy rate in the UK is because that's not the only reason. Is because you know the huge amount of out of town retail development. Which has been granted in recent years, and of course, it was deeply unfortunate that um, Antrim Newton Abbey Council only a few days ago granted permission for a huge out of town store, which will take ninety percent from local stores, um, complete in contradiction to the, the Department of Infrastructure's town centre first planning policy. So I think what we've got to try and do in terms of a recovery package is ensure that whatever way it's worked, and this is obviously the councils of a key role in this, that there is a moratorium, because the last thing struggling high streets need is more out-of-town retail development. Out-of-town retail development is, uh, it's like a, a relic from the 20th century. It belongs in the past. The future is 21st century, vibrant town and city centres with, with an ecosystem approach to business, with a that dynamic and diverse retail and hospitality offering, that's the future. Not more big boxes in fields out of town. It is about ensuring that we have vibrant town and city centres. And I think the Department of Infrastructure has to make sure that, that planning and the councils, the councils cannot just completely push aside the Department of Infrastructure's uh, strategic planning policy. And sadly, I think that is exactly what happened. In terms of Antrim Newton Abbey, they pushed, they didn't, they completely ignored the uh, all the evidence in regard to uh, the, the store. They thought they would get a quick fix in terms of a short term jobs boost, but didn't and want to know about the impact that would have on indigenous retailers and the impact that it has in destroying and dislodging existing retail jobs. So I think that was a bad move. So we want to see the minister a bit more hands on in relation to. Uh, planning policy and making sure council stay within the law. Okay, uh, so, so you'd like to have more control of pl um, planning from the department, but yet in the next item you're actually asking for um, them to devolve on street car parking and responsibility for local roads to councils. I'm not sure how how you think that they would be able to do that any better. 
what our appeal is to the councils is, you know, stay within the law. I mean, you know, it is town centre first retail planning policy. I mean, it's a relatively simple concept to understand. I think in term, we, we want to see a crucial role for the councils. You know, we're not trying to take powers away from them. Quite the contrary. You know, we've been arguing for the regeneration powers to be given to the councils. We want to see uh, on-street car parking, local roads. Um, so we want to see councils playing their full role in terms of economic development and COVID recovery. And that's why we say we talk about this concept of localism. And localism is about changing the leadership model in our local areas, in our local communities and in our local towns. So, you know, it's the very fact that if we want to get changes to car parking in Murray and Lisbon city centres, that we don't have to go all the way to the minister's private office to get a meeting. Um, that we, the councils themselves, working with their local chambers and working with their local industry, can arrive at a solution. So, and I think, so what we've got to try and do is make sure that councils and the assembly executive business, wire civic society, is all pushing in the one direction. Okay, well, I suppose, I suppose what, what, what I would like you to do is properly is, re, is to look at the proposal that you have with regards to responsibility for local roads. And, and certainly if you have been, if you've heard any of the discussions in, in this committee with regards to um, the challenge that we put to um, DFI around um, road maintenance and so on, it's, it's actually not as straightforward perhaps as you might think. Um, so I'm, I'm, I suppose I... I, I I might consider the idea of the on-street car parking, but I suppose I would need more information with regards to where your thinking is with regards to responsibility for local roads, because that's quite a broad statement. Yeah, well, I think that certainly, I mean, the regeneration powers was always envisaged that they would come. Um, and I think it, uh, uh, and, you know, obviously our colleagues in Nilga and Solis would have much more detail in terms of the exact uh, agenda that they want. But you know, in terms of the actual spend, local councils in Northern Ireland have actually a very, very low percentage of spend in relation to um, the economy and many of the, the sort of important services. So I think, you know, in many respects, what's the point of giving councils power uh, over planning, but not give them power over regeneration? So, you know, for instance, so they're trying to get things done in town city centres, uh, but they're constantly have to refer back, say, for the Department of Communities, who has infrastructure, or sorry, the Department of Communities, who have got the regeneration power. And likewise, you know, if they want to get changes to car parking, that you have, you know, off-street car parking in the remit of the councils, but on-street is the Department of Infrastructure. I mean, that, that, you know, that, that is, there's a contradiction there. I think we need to resolve things like that because, you know, very much... What our members want to do is get on and start rebuilding their high streets, rebuilding their businesses, and trying to sort of ask themselves what the success looked like in terms of post-pandemic. We, we've made a call this week for, now obviously, whatever the executive decides, it's very clear that we may not get a date for the reopening of non-essential retail. But that's not to say the councils and the executive couldn't start work in making sure COVID marshals are ready in every town centre, that uh, we have uh, public hand sanitising units in every town centre and major high streets, uh, things like the COVID compliance uh, on the you know, scores and the doors for businesses. All of that there, I think that work can start now. So whenever we do get to a point where we can reopen non-essential retail and, and hopefully hospitality as well, and that's all dependent on the regs and the science, that we can hit the ground running. Um, so it's important that preparation is done there. But again, it's councils working with the executive, obviously working with the Department of Infrastructure as well. I have other questions, but there are lots of others have indicated, so I'll, I'll see yeah, if there's anything sure. I mean, I can stay on to about 25 pat for another 10 minutes, if that's okay. Indicated, so um, Mr Buchanan. Okay, I'll just ask the one question then, I'll not be selfish, like, like others. That's <laughs> right, Chair. A rural town investment and infrastructure investments fund line you've put on your paper here should be reduced. Yeah. What does that mean? And, and, and what uh, ideas would you do? You know, what are you going to do with that investment fund? Invest in what? Well, I, I think it's about ensuring that uh, the infrastructure in many of the town centres, uh, in many rural areas, is uh, that there is investment in that. It's making sure that, for instance, the transport infrastructure supports. Uh, many of those towns, 
so I think it is about ensuring that, you know, to use that term, that we level up all parts of Northern Ireland. So, you know, it's making sure that, uh, you know, that, our, that many of our small rural towns, you know, are uh, able to not just survive, but thrive as well. So I think, you know, the Department of Infrastructure has a key role in that. I mean, one of the things we've talked about quite a lot about uh, the, the Boris Borough, uh, what I'd like to see is obviously, and this takes in part Tom and your constituency, you know, is, is you know, do we get to the point where we reestablish the rail network out to the west again? Um, I think that would be a much better investment than uh, a tunnel between Scotland and Northern Ireland. But what we've got to make sure is the roads network, all of that there supports those towns, you know, supports, you know, Marafeld, supports Cookstown, uh, all of those, you know, in Mid-Ulster. Um, which, uh, you know, there's some many fine independent retailers, so we want to make sure that the infrastructure investment for those towns is there and that they themselves get, uh, you know, a slice of the action in relation to uh, the city and growth deeds. A final quick point that you referred to, on-street parking charges or, you know, town centre parking, you know, where, which could be run by councils, and obviously that's the position in Cookstown, Mark Rafelt. We have been lobbying to try and remove, in Cookstown, for example, you park for one hour. Reta local retailers want to move that to two hours. Now, I appreciate it's not an issue today, but that is an issue to get people back into the town centres because going into a shop is not a 15 minute operation anymore or 20. It takes longer if, if, if a man or woman has a few children, etc. The whole hand sanitizer, the social distance, and the queuing. Is that something you're directly lobbying for within the DFI to get those town centres user friendly for parking, whether it's council parking or DFI on street parking or time restraints on that parking? Um, sorry, I, I didn't pick up every year. The, the, the line is not great, but I picked up some of what, what you said. Um, I think that what, what, you know, part of what we're trying to do in terms of, of getting our, our towns and our high streets ready for reopening, it's primarily by giving the confidence to shoppers and consumers um, that our high streets are safe for them to go back to. And obviously, uh, our, our members have spent millions making sure their stores are COVID compliant, but what we've got to make sure is the external environment in our high streets and our town centres uh, is up to scratch. One of the things that I observed um, during the, the uh, you lose touch when we're in lockdown and when we're not in lockdown is you know that two week period uh, in December when uh, retail and hospitality was uh, reopened. The, the COVID marshals, the hand sanitising and the scores and board, it was patchy. Some councils were doing it better than others. And then what we've got and what we've said to the executive office is we need them to uh, ensure that there is a framework, that they produce a framework for councils um, to make sure that there is uniform across the board in, in, in all our major town and city centres and high streets. So I think, and obviously retailers are very keen to be part of that discussion. Um, and, uh, you know, we're very, uh, um, you know, we've put a number of suggestions. I think one of the things we'd like to see in practical terms come out of tomorrow's executive meeting is the restoration of click and collect uh, on a strictly uh, appointment only basis. I think that will be an important lifeline and a first step in this sort of roadmap for a reopening. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Mr. Muir? Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Glenn, for your presentation and taking the time um, to come to us, albeit uh, virtually. Um, conscious of time, so just my questions really around one issue in, in your briefing with Susan um, You were talking about a uh, digital solution from the store the shelf. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Well, I, this is something, I mean, this is an evolving situation. Um, uh, you know, and you know, may well change in the next few days. But I think, you know, what, what we've seen, and, you know, our membership covers uh, wholesalers uh, and independent retailers and suppliers of the sector as well. So that gives us almost unique perspective in terms of the challenges in relation to supply chain. So I think that trying to reduce the paperwork, the bureaucracy um, is, is, key, is key to that. So if we can get a, a solution which is primarily based on digital, which obviously makes sure from a wholesale, retail, logistical, it works for them that we don't have the paperwork, we don't have uh, the bureaucracy. So 
you know, we're 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 actively talking to our members, and part of the reasons why I have to sort of leave in about sort of five or six minutes is that you know we're bringing some of those uh, members together with the DR minister to discuss some of those solutions. But you know, we we've all along seen this uh, as a challenge, not necessarily a crisis, and we've always tried to sort of take uh, and put forward solutions. And of course. We've made progress in things like groupage, second-hand cars, steam. So what we've got to do is keep that solution-based and problem-solving approach front and centre to, to all of this. That's why we need the continued flexibilities from the EU and the UK government to make sure uh, that there are more derogations and more mitigations. Um, and you know, and I think if we can get those uh, and we can get long-term solutions, then I think we can. Uh, to use a, a sort of typical lowland expression, it will eventually collapse into place. Yeah. Just some of the solutions that have been discussed most recently are the sort of Swiss style arrangements in relation to the SPF. Is that something you would support? I think it's, an, it's something that we want to look in. I think it is certainly uh, it is something that is gathering momentum now. Um, I think it will be interesting to see uh, how that moves on from tomorrow's meeting. Um, with the vice president, so I, yes, I think that it potentially has legs. Um, uh, but I think what we, you know, ultimately, if you look at the impact this has had, we, we've certainly at the first few weeks there were difficulties, there were delays, there were some products that are not there. But by and large, our members have worked through this, and our wholesale members have worked through this. Yes, we've seen some products not available. Uh, we've some seen some delays, but fundamentally, levels of stock are good. Um, and you know we've made sure that you know if you look comparatively uh, in many of our food retail member stores that there isn't the same number of empty shelves. Now that's not to say there isn't a problem, there isn't a challenge there. Yes, there is, and I think what we've got to try and do is get that continuing level of engagement. And I think very much what has to happen has to be an extension in the grace period. And not so that we can have that sort of laser-like approach to arriving at solutions, uh, and not just kicking the can down the road. Yeah. Lastly, um, just in terms of independent retailers, my local independent food retailer, which is in the Brunswick Road, uh, and a nice little plug, uh, is a great store because it sources a lot of its goods locally. And you know the protocol and the arrangements that we're in place now means that Northern Ireland can trade, trade with. The EU and also the GC uh, and a much better state really compared to other businesses in GB. Uh, are, you, are you seeing people taking benefit of that fact that, that, that there is freedom in Northern Ireland to be able to support it locally? Well, I think you know supporting local has always been the bottom line for many of our wholesale and retail members, so it's nothing new. And I think there could be the possibility uh, of increased trade for many of those local businesses. And what we've tried to do in Retail and I is that um, we've brought a lot of those new manufacturers, producers into our membership, and we've tried to connect them up to our retail and wholesale members and try to be their route to market. So um, Mash Direct's route to market uh, quite a few years ago now was through one of our members in Killale. Um And you know, obviously at that point, they didn't have the way we're all to uh, get into the large supermarkets. So their route to market was in one store and from there you know, they're all the way in Dubai and so on. So I do think that that's something that we've always tried to do in relation to helping those suppliers connect them up. And I think we need to do an awful lot more of that. Um, and I think that there, that maybe the maybe the one uh, silver lining in all of this is that there will be an increased uh, focus on local and doing even more local and that hopefully that will be something that we can explore more of. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Beggs. Okay. Voice doesn't seem to be there. Um, Ms. Kimmins? Sorry, Chair, thank you. Just a very quick one. 
when we you know we talked at length about the, the car parking and enforcement. I mean, as a representative from your area, I'm sure you're not be surprised. It's an issue that's been raised with me quite a lot, and it's something I've raised continuously with the minister. Um, and as particularly with Mary being sent to parking zone, certainly the, the business community would feel that it's quite unfair, actually, that, that it, ha- it is a central parking zone, you know, and over the last number of months, I have actually been presented with evidence that this was a uh, traffic ordinance in large and in all empty car parks, which I, I, I don't really understand because my, whilst I appreciate um, there's enforcement rules, I think it doesn't, it doesn't, um, certainly doesn't help the community that people are being taken to maybe a hundred other streets there. It's not as if it's a traffic management issue. Just in relation to the impact of COVID. In, in the first uh, period of restrictions, I had asked the minister, and, and she did, um, she did uh, respond to positively about relaxing parking enforcement, and, and the council has also stepped in and did that for all street parking. This time around, I asked again, and unfortunately, um, the minister declined uh, the suggestion to either relax parking enforcement or, or reduce fees, or, or you know, to try and help support businesses during this time. What you know? What would your thoughts on that? Do you think that is something that would help? And um, particularly, as you say, we don't really know when um, reopening will be announced at this stage. It's, it's maybe a phased approach. I'm not sure, but uh, is that something you think would be a good support to businesses as we move forward? Well, I think we need to get car parking right. I think the difficulty that we've had even way before the pandemic is almost this overzealous approach of. Uh, many of the traffic uh, wardens, and I know this has been a particular problem in Newry, uh, in Newry City Centre. Um, and I think you know, we recognise they have a job to do. It is we do need traffic enforcement. We need the turnover of cars in 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 our town and city centres and our high streets. I think there is a particular uh, problem uh, in Newry and Lisburn in the fact that you're you know that you as you said your on street car parking you pay for. Um, whereas in Armagh or in Van Bridge, your first hour on on street is free, and you're probably thinking, you know, it's not a great deal, but it is a great deal for those traders, you know, particularly for many of those independent retailers where their customers are dropping off and away again. So I, I uh, and I suppose it is for sure. We I don't think we've got to meet with the infrastructure minister yet on this, but it is important, and we're not saying, look, you know, uh, we're not against in any way. Our town centres being much more friendly towards people who cycle, who walk, uh, and and use public transport. We're a big champion of public transport. But it's giving the shopper that option and it's giving them that choice. Uh, And I think that uh, that, that's crucially important. So, you know, Lisburn and Murray, you know, they're asking, they're they're asking our traders there and the Chamber of Commerce are asking, you know, very simple ask, give us what our surround, our colleagues in Banbridge and other surrounding towns have. One hour free, uh, in relation to on street car parking, which means you know you can still have that turnover, but you're not you're putting that less onus uh, onto the shopper. And of course, the big out of town stores that I've touched upon, they don't have any traffic wardens. They can have bus routes, apps, you know, if you like, change to them. They pay less rates per square foot. So those big out of town stores have a competitive disadvantage. They are a competitive advantage to many of our town and city centres. And do you know what? If we're serious about this recovery, that needs to stop. That absolutely needs to stop. And the frustrating thing that many of the COVID-19 regulations, now it's not intentional, but the biggest impact they have is in small independent retailers and small business. It's not on the large supermarkets. And one of the biggest things that we get through our office, you know, is in relation to click and collect, where those big supermarkets can sell toys, books, uh, clothes. You get independent retailers who sell those very same products. Obviously, they are closed, but they can't even do click and collect. So, what we've got to try and do, and of course, and this is what we're serious about recovery, is make sure there's a level playing field there for our town and city centres and the large supermarkets. And that's, I don't think, an unreasonable thing to ask for. Yeah, and I would certainly agree with you again. And I think just my final point on that is I know um, Yuri Bid have done quite a lot of work on, on this. And they, they recently did a survey to define what the key issues were for local business and the single uh, biggest issue for business community and wider was parking in Uri. So I think that, you know, I mean, in, in the times we're living in, the fact that that is still a major issue, um, is, it, it, 
that certainly tells me that something has to be done, that something needs to be done soon. And now is the time when we look at the high street class portion, all of those things that have been set up now, um, that all needs fed in and addressed. Hopefully, we'll follow up. But thank you, Glenn, and thank you, Chair. Cheers, Liz. Um, two others have indicated Campbell Boyle and Martina Anderson. Do you have time to take their questions? Yeah, listen, uh, maybe if you want to take the two of them together and I can maybe answer yes, two sure. together, if that's okay, Chair. Okay, um, Mr. Boyle and then Ms. Anderson. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I'll be quick and thanks Lynn, for the presentation. Then you're espousing here, you know, the way that local people have gone back into the local towns that are playing a big part, like every 70 pence spent. It spent goes re directly back into the local economy. But, but my point is, how do we capitalise that and keep the people there? You, you mentioned the issue of the World Trade Infrastructure Investment Fund. Can you respond to me a bit more that or even make the committee and your thinking on that? Um, my final point, just quickly, is the issue of lack of connectivity in the hubs, you know, you know, people in these towns. So that's the three quick points. Really in hurry. Can you just expand a wee bit on those bits? Okay. Uh, um, thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you um, for the presentation. Look, there's loads of questions, but I'll just focus on one here. And it's in relation to the right infrastructure within the towns and cities and rural centres. Um, if we want to uh, support our retailers moving forward. So I would like to add to the A2 Bond Plan and Road Scheme. I had previously engaged with yourselves and the retailers about it. I've been meeting with the department. I know you're still concerned about the design of the road. And I think that's just an example of the retailers' voice, views, understanding needs to be taken into account by the department. And if you can comment on that, I'll leave the rest of the questions. Brilliant. Listen, uh, Martina, and thanks, and, and hope you're well. Um, listen, I, I think to the chair, um, we, you know, I, I do believe our rural towns have a key role to play in not just a recovery, but obviously developing future our retail and hospitality offer, developing the overall attractiveness, you know, of uh, of, of Northern Ireland uh, as a region, both as a tourist destination uh, and for visitors generally. So we want to ensure that. Uh, for instance, that there each of our rural towns, for instance, is a vacancy strategy that we work through uh, and develop, and and I think part of what part of what we'd like to see is many more business improvement districts um, being established. Um, you know, the the sort of nine, eight or nine that we have at the minute have done a fantastic role. And what that does is it puts the traders back into the driving seat. So it, rather than them coming to MLAs or councillors. It's they themselves are part of, as I said of this at the very beginning, that it's making sure the business community is co-designing, uh, co-designing the strategy, co-designing co um, what the solutions are, and building something that's very different. In relation to well, Connor Road, Martina, uh, my understanding, whatever, that things are moving in the right direction, um, and you know, I, as you know yourself, the asks that we have uh, of the infrastructure department. I think are fairly modest, but it just shows you the importance of the continuing dialogue between the Department of Infrastructure and the business community. And you know, just for the benefit of other members, you know, we would have had a very good development, which you know we support the development of redevelopment of Connor Road. But we could have had a situation where the indigenous traders on that road would have been cut off from their custom local customer base. Um, so we're working at against solutions with the department to make sure that that doesn't happen and this great investment can move forward. So, I mean, I think maybe just in conclusion, I, it, it underlines the need for, as the minister has said, an infrastructure commission um, that brings together some of those key players um, and charts a, lo a, a longer term future. But, you know, we see things like the High Street Task Force, not as a silver bullet, um, but also, but you know, as a means to an end. Um, so I think that you know, what I've got to focus on uh, is the recovery, and I think that the Department of Infrastructure and the role of this committee has a key role to play in terms of that future debate. So, Chair, thank you very much. Apologies, I, I can't um, stay longer, but I've a, a minister on, on another line. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. Okay, members.
be any other comments in relation to that? Stage? No. Okay. We'll move on then to our forward work program. Yeah, just on that, I mean, obviously, then was he didn't go back on some of the points. Just maybe could clarify in relation to those couple of points about connectivity and about um, the the structural fund he mentioned, the investment fund. Maybe we can come back a wee bit more on that if we're right to him again, yeah? By moving then to item 11, which is a forward work programme, just draw your attention to that at page 143. At next week's meeting, there'll be a briefing from the department on the SL1 for a financial scheme for bus and coach operators. And then we'll have our own sort of short informal session just looking at um, forward work planning. Um, and there'll be a, present, a presentation by the assembly researcher. Um, just further on from that, on the 24th of March, um, I'll just remind you that um, the course we did receive correspondence <coughs> some time ago from the era committee um, with regards to a briefing which they're going to be receiving from tss and hmrc and the proposal at that time was for it to be a joint committee session with ourselves economy and um, uh, agriculture committee so that's going to take place on the 24th of um, march we've received correspondence which will be in next week's papers um, from the chair of the economy committee suggesting that that they would she would actually then be act as the chair of the sitting and um, myself and the era committee chair would then act as deputies um, there will be a process which will have to be ironed out as to how we would then ask questions because as you can imagine there are three committees coming together so um, that's going to be a bit of a, a challenge so um, if you're content, just really to note that in, in the meantime, but it was really just to flag that up, that that's coming on the 24th of March. Um, do members have any other business that they'd like to raise at this point? No? Okay. Um, Chair. Mr. Muir? Yeah, it's just under, under any other business, yes? Yes. Yeah, it's just, um, obviously in recent days, we've heard reports in relation to what the UK government plans and the Union Connectivity Review in relation to uh, a physical link between Scotland and Northern Ireland. And um, I would be proposing we write to the department and ask to see what contact and liaison has been made from the UK government and from the UK Connectivity Review to the department, because I think it's important that the devolved institutions are given their place in relation to this and are given their opportunity to have their say. And I think the first step would be to ascertain whether the department has been contacted in relation to this and whether they have proper review in regards to that. We are, we are aware that the, the minister has been in contact with um, those carrying out that review and the minister was to, um, to copy us into her response, so it might be timely for us to ask for that as well. Yeah, it would be, be good to get that, Chair, and that would be appreciated. And also to understand whether that contact was initiated by the review and by the UK government, because a number of these announcements are being made without any reference to the devolved institutions. Okay. Anything further? Okay, so the, the next meeting will take place at 9.30 next Wednesday in room 29. So I propose now that the meeting's adjourned. Thank you. Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed.